can do very little to protect themselves. The cyclist or the driver on the busy main road can often do nothing but drive into the pothole and take the hit. If we consider some of the issues that young people have faced, not just over the course of the last year, but throughout their lifetimes, they've been a direct association of them hitting the potholes. We can't take a pothole approach to change. And by that, what I mean is we can't keep driving over it, watching it get bigger until it collapses and causes irreparable damage. If we can then instead move beyond looking for how we can try to fix things, it, we need to move beyond the patching up. And I'm sure over the last year, what many of us as leaders have found difficult is we've been faced by things of Friday night announcements and Monday night U-turns have all made it incredibly difficult to know how we can address some of these bigger issues together. At the heart of all of it is actually the need for systemic change. And we've got to look at how we can address some of these big problems together. And I've put there, as you can see, some more images for, to consider in the sense that, you know, we've got to move beyond just the patching up of the roads, um, just the things that actually we're not making things better. So the important thing of days like today is that it actually brings together the work of the Institute of Education, the Education Observatory, our research centre, and other external agencies to address this very question, how can we demonstrate impact? And what I've captured there for you are some of the key aspects that we want to be able to see within some of our conversations today. What is it that we are comparing things to? How do we ensure that reliability and that validity? How can the ways in which we address one problem then be the same when we start to address others? That whole thing of scalability, because we're doing it in one place, will it work somewhere else? And it's only then when we start to consider what we can replicate and how we can repli replicate it that we'll be begin to understand the scale of change. I'm sure that within our sessions today, you'll have the opportunity to consider the potholes and what it is that you, can, you as leaders can do to address them. But instead of fixing the potholes with that temporary fix, I'd like to look at how we can come together to build some new roads. I'm going to end there with my introduction, but I want to end by saying a huge thank you to all leaders, both across the Black Country and the White West Midlands and beyond, wherever you've come from today, for the contribution that you've made to education over the course of the last year. Um, and I look forward to working together in collaboration beyond today. Thank you. Sean? Yep. Thank you, Diana. Um, so uh, thank you for a, a very uh, thoughtful opening address. I'm going to unpin Diana in the nicest of ways, of course. Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, ask Nadia and Claire from the, the um, Violence Reduction Unit to um, get ready to present while I just change things over. So bear with me one moment. Thank you. Sorry, folks, I'm just having some technical issues. Bear with me. 
I don't think we have any slides to present, Sean, if that helps. That probably does help, Claire. Are you ready to make a start? Yeah, shall I just start talking? Is that um, helpful? I think so. And sure. I can't hear Sean. Sean, are you you're on mute? Oh sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm just making spotlight for everybody. So hopefully. Claire, That's great. Excellent. So Claire, you're now spotlighted. Apologies for the slight delay. Um, I'm still getting a hang of Zoom, if I'm honest with you, but we'll get there. Thank you, Claire. That's OK. We're all getting the hang of new things at the moment, aren't we? Um, so, so good morning, everybody. My name's Claire Gollop. I'm the director of the Violence Reduction Unit. And um, you'll meet some of my team later today. And I hopefully you'll work with us over the coming year. Um, probably as I stand in front of this panel of um, what I'm told is hundreds of head teachers, I am perhaps forever the 12 year old girl who was um, quite frightened actually to be anywhere but in school, didn't know how to reach out and who truanted the last lesson of every day because it was just too dangerous for me to be in a predictable place on the way home from school. And I'm so glad that schools now are so much more alert to exploitation and to harm in general. You have really rigorous approaches to safeguarding, but the more that we open our eyes, the more that we see. That can be quite overwhelming, I think, the number of potholes and the cracks that are out there, as Diana alluded to. If we exclude London, which has three times as many people, but four times as much knife crime, the West Midlands has the highest rates of knife crime in England and Wales. There were more than 3,400 incidents where people in our community reported that they were harmed by a blade last year. That's 11 reports of violence more generally for every thousand people that live here. Back when we had a thriving nighttime economy, um, if we can remember that, you might have felt a bit reassured that these events perhaps clustered around city centres, but the pandemic has stripped away that top cover of nighttime economy violence and it's revealed instead an underlying epidemic of violence with hotspots that correlate with a number of other structural inequalities, particularly deprivation. Violence and exploitation is happening right here on a massive scale. And by here, I mean the communities that you live in and the schools that you and that your schools serve. I very much doubt that you needed me to tell you that. I expect many of you have experienced or dread receiving notification that a child you support and care for has been seriously injured, has died or has been arrested for harming another. I've sat with head teachers over the past few weeks that were facing all of those situations and I've seen what incredible strength it takes to lead a school through a crisis like that. The ripple effects of serious violence absolutely pervade our community. It touches siblings, bystanders, witnesses, classmates, staff, and of course, parents. Collectively, we all fear for all of our children and that fear can absolutely paralyze us. The VIU will stand next to you if and when that happens. We're working with others to ensure that schools are absolutely the heart of community resilience plans that kick into place when a tragedy occurs. That's not the default at the moment, but we think it should be for the future. And we can help you to prepare for such an eventuality and to provide services that can help to stop the transmission of violence afterwards in the aftermath. And together with the police, we can help staff and school communities to understand and to recognise signs of exploitation, of gang affiliation, of vulnerability, and to know when and how to pass that information on and to ensure that there are services that can support young people to exit what can be incredibly complex and dangerous situations to get out of. As a VRU, we aim to provide an off-ramp for those who've got caught up in violence through services based in accident emergency departments, in hospitals, in police custody, in schools and in alternative provision. Our VIU is one of a network of 18 around the country funded by the Home Office and we have a specific remit to bring together systems that for too long have operated in isolation. We're able to convene and to invest across organisational boundaries, bringing together local authorities, children's services, police, health agencies, probation, youth offending, CPS, prisons and education. These are all systems that you would have seen work at their best 
but that you might also find incredibly frustrating most of the time. I've heard a lot already about delays in accessing adult or child support services, particularly for mental health, and about the implications of transport, criminal justice, benefits and housing decisions on the young people in your care. We're here to prevent violence and not just to respond to it. We want to create the conditions where it's more likely than not that preventative action will be taken early and will be sustained until the risk has passed. For the rest of the day today, you'll be talking about some of the most powerful preventative actions that we can take as a society, creating inclusive learning environments and school communities where young people belong and can thrive, where they feel safe and they are safe, and where they can nurture positive relationships with each other and with the adults around them. This is your superpower, it's what you can bring to the violence reduction agenda. But if it was as easy as that, you know, you're all good people, you'd be doing it already because it would make sense across such a range of different measures of success. So I'm thoroughly expecting you to highlight and identify some practical challenges. We want to hear about those, but more than that, we want to do something about them with you. The VRU is an excellent escalation route to local and to national government to flag issues that are inhibiting your ability to make your school a beacon of safety. A new cross-government crime and justice task force chaired by the Prime Minister is looking at just this issue and they'd like to know where different government departments policies pull away from rather than towards this goal and I feel sure you might be able to think of a few. Um, this task force wrote recently through DfE to all alternative provision heads in the country encouraging them to engage specifically with their local VIU. We know that alternative provision settings need to be higher in our priorities and that the children within them have a raft of overlapping vulnerability and as a cohort they're simply closer to the edge. I've heard just earlier this week from the heads of local alternative provision about just how challenging the dynamics are for them to manage and just how much potential there is in the children in their care. I also heard about how important it is to get that support in far earlier in a young person's journey and that takes us back into mainstream and towards far younger age groups and so it comes full circle. There is work here for all of us to do and the benefits you'll harvest from actions of social justice and inclusion will not just address vulnerability to multiple forms of exploitation and harm but I'm told by those teachers will aid many day-to-day -day school management challenges as well. I'm here today to ask for your help in this violence reduction agenda and that ask was made much more poignant yesterday when I was talking with a group of young people who've been working with us on a project to help us really listen as organisations to other young people and like all other conversations with young people when we tap into who influences them there is firstly a raft of other young people influencers cultural figures musicians that I've never heard of and then they're consistently is their teachers and the others who are in their school space. They tell us that you, you are who, they tell us they listen to, and crucially, you are the adults that they feel most listened to by. You are their lifelines, and you're already doing so much to keep them safe, and for that, I thank you. Through your presence here, you've signaled you're keen to do even more, and for that, I thank you as well, and offer our efforts alongside yours. So with my thanks to the University of Wolverhampton for this collaboration, can I now introduce you to the VIU Strategic Lead for Education, Nadia Hussein, who's going to set out a little of the work we have in train, our ambition for the future in the education space. I hope you all have a fantastic day. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you, Claire. And I'd like to humbly welcome you all to this conference today. And thank you so much, you know, for everybody coming together. So my name is Nadia Hussein, and I'm the Education Strategic Manager. In a past life, and still at heart, I'm a teacher. Um, I've led um, within school behaviour, safeguarding, and SEND. Um, education really, really sits incredibly pertinently within the VIU strand and one of the obvious reasons for those is that as educators we hold a massive massive stake at the table we're with our children for approximately 35 hours per week and for some of our most vulnerable young people school is the only normaliser that they have um, within the education structure itself we've got myself we've got the delivery manager and we've got seven education intervention advisors and they're based in each local authority uh, education intervention advisors work with each local authority inclusion, vulnerability and behaviour department team. Um, the local authorities, we work with schools, we work with maps and our work is incredibly data driven just so that we can really work with the priority schools. And some of those priority schools are Prus, 
alternative provisions and schools that have high rates of exclusions and of course there are lots of other vulnerability um, factors as well including young people that are pupil premium, SEND, early help and children that are within the care system. And what we'd like to do is offer to work with schools to help become more trauma informed through some of the programmes that we deliver. Some of the programmes that we deliver are mentors in violence prevention and ACEs training. And I think another part of the kind of crucial work that we're doing is, I like to call it knitting together within the local authorities, is bringing together services that support young people, that support schools and support the education sector itself to ensure that every child has a chance at life through education. Um, we've also co-produced with educators a toolkit around well-being and inclusion. I'm sure, I think a link has been sent to all of you. And that just really sets out the context of areas and shines the light on vulnerability within education and what the ambition is of the VIU to work with the education sector. We've also got a sector reference steering group and that meets every half term. And that really helps us shape and drive the direction of the work and the priorities. And it comprises of um, Ofsted, of SLCN leads, SEMH leads, educational psychology, the police and wider education partners. Um, and that's really to ensure that, you know, the work that we do is absolutely strategically driven and we're listening to the sector and co-producing and shaping with the sector itself. Um, our education intervention advisors based in each local authority will be more than pleased to meet with yourselves and to discuss what we can do with the schools. But most importantly, um, within this conversation is yourselves. And no VRU team here has a VRU ivory tower. We absolutely believe and massively hold that the strength is within the sector itself, with yourselves, with education leaders. And what we'd really like post today is to come together with your expertise in shaping some of the work that we do with some of our young people. Um, and for some of our young people, as, as Claire has mentioned, it is about life and death, as we saw with the tragic death of the young person a few weeks ago. And sadly, it won't be the first and, and it won't be the last. And the cold truth of some of this is we're not going to save them all. And what really lies, I guess, at the heart of all of this is intent. And it's a word that has come up for us educators um, back in 2019 with the new um, inspection framework. I think section five, if I can specifically remember. And what do we mean by the word intent? And Ofsted describe it as at the heart of what do we want our pupils to know? What do we want our pupils to know? And for many of us that have been in education, you know, there'll be numerous case studies, names of children that we've worked with, um, some children that still, you know, are part of our conscious as well, that we've really tried to make a difference with. Um, and I just wanted to share with you as such a young man um, whose name is really prevalent with myself, whose permanent exclusion meeting that I sat on back in 2018. Now, this young boy was called um, Safwan. And just to give you a bit of a background, he was one of three children, middle child. He came from a home where father had mental health issues, witnessed DV, there was lots of debt, bailiffs at the door. Um, one of the stabilizers within his family was his mom, who was a professional, had a career, was incredibly driven. Um, but just to kind of surface some of the complexities here, I invite you to just think about cultural humility with our young people come from many diverse backgrounds and the layers of how we understand the complexities that they come from aren't linear and they can be very gritty. Some of our young people come from diverse backgrounds where they come from nested structures of diversity but complexity too. And what held, I guess, his mum back was sticking around to hold it together, cultural pressures um, of the archetype, archaic Pakistani values of sacrifice, of the role of the mother and the wife, etc. But one of the stabilizers also within his um, life for Safwan was sport. That was greatly influenced by his father. And as a result of that, Safwan was a Thai boxing prodigy. Um, in September 2018, Safwan's mum finally took the step and the bold step of going through a divorce. And of course, that has a massive impact on young people. Um, the trauma of separation, of divorce, etc. And that added further complexities and challenges to the family and Safwan himself. And then tragically in October, a few weeks later, Safwan's father passed away. Um, just to note, 
that from the point of Safwan's father passing away and the funeral, Safwan attended school. And that really speaks volume of the school and the relationship that he had with the school and that massive sense of belonging where you've got a young life here where everything has turned upside down, but that one normaliser that he had, he still voted with his feet and was still his stability in this world that he had. Um, then tragically, another situation took place where five weeks after his father's death, a friend that he'd had a falling out with um, told him to suck his dad's mm. Safwan saw red mist and it resulted in a fist fight, a nasty fist fight, and resulted in a decision being made where Safwan should be permanently excluded from school. Now, Safwan had an impeccable school record and he ended up on a decision panel for PX for the fight. The issue here was that the school has a zeroance tolerance approach. The hardest thing for me sitting on this school exclusion panel was that I was sat there as his mom. And to witness your child or any child break down and begging to be saved. The real pertinent question for me at that point to the head was, what is your intent? What do you want Safwan to know? And what are we telling our children? What are we telling our most vulnerable children? Children and young people that are angry, that have behaviors that play out. What must they have experienced? Are we showing them compassion? Are we showing them love? Are we showing them understanding? And what would our schools be like if we strived towards that? And we started looking at the reasons behind those behaviors. Every exclusion, be a child sent out of a classroom, be a child sent into an isolation room. If we looked at that as a window of opportunity, why is this taking place? And I'd just like for you to take a moment and think of a moment where you probably felt most vulnerable. But within that moment, by someone, you were loved, you were understood. Someone took the time to really see you, hear you, and deal with you compassionately. Can we let our children know this? Can we have this intent for our children? And what would we like our children to know? Within the frontline sector, you know, our services as civil servants are underpinned by principles of compassion. Be it the health service, helping our most vulnerable. And I guess the effigy for that ultimately is Florence Nightingale. Um, be it policing and appeal principles, service to our most vulnerable again, and um, you know, self-sacrifice. And again, these are from Sir Robert Peel. Um, and I guess for education. It's all about caring for children first and subjects second. Who is our refugee for education? I guess I'd really like to welcome you all, invite you to any thoughts on that and just put some names in the chat bar. But it's children first and it's always going to be children first within education, how we hold them, how we support them, and not just for the many, but also our most vulnerable few. Having had the privilege of meeting so many of our school's heads and teachers and thinkers, I think you're all doing an absolutely phenomenal job. And I know as a teacher, we switch between so many heads any given day at a time. You know, as teachers, we put, have to put our parent hat on, we have to put our tough love hat on, we have to put our friend hat on at times. Um, and in the current climate as well, in the profession, I absolutely salute you for carrying, out, for carrying yourselves first foremost and carrying our children. And I guess I invite you all to really open your hearts more than ever to our intent. What do we want our children to know when they come back? And as we know with our young people, and especially our most vulnerable young people, their vulnerabilities have been exacerbated even further within this pandemic. And I invite you to come together and let's all come together as education, as wider partners to make our children's futures real again. Let's, let's rethink, let's be bold, and let's just really ensure, you know, that within our, uh, within our intent, we ensure that every child has a chance at life and every child has a chance at education. 
and ultimately as educators you know just really rethinking reshaping just challenging ourselves as well but really understanding that we ultimately we hold our pens and we hold our hearts to rewrite our futures so thank you all thank you nadia um so again very inspirational from both you and claire I'm now going to hand over, so bear with us while we do this crossover, to um, Professor Andrew Peterson. Um, so bear with me while I make him spotlight and um, look forward to his presentation on character and virtual leadership. One moment. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Nadia. Can everybody, Sean, can everybody see my screen on the slides? Not that I can see at the moment, bear with me. Yes, we can. We can, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd just like to thank uh, the conference organizers for inviting uh, me to speak. My name is Andrew Peterson. I'm a professor and one of the uh, two deputy directors of the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues in the School of Education, University of Birmingham. Um, my email address is there and uh, the centre's website address is on the slides as well. Just a couple of things uh, about the slides. Rather than having references on the slides, there's a list at the end. Yeah, my email address is there. Please do get in contact with any questions after the event. And I've shared the slides with the, uh, with the conference organisers. So, so hopefully they're available um, to you. So I've been asked to speak about character and virtue within educational um, leadership. And uh, just as an overview of the, of the presentation, I'd like to talk about three things. So first is, a, is an introduction to character education. It'll be quite a quick introduction. Uh, and my colleague, Aidan Thompson, uh, who's with us today, and uh, Aidan and I will be running uh, one of the breakout sessions. So we'll say a bit more um, about these ideas of character education. And then say something about character education and leadership, um, and then something about character education and justice from a leadership um, perspective. But to pick up on some of the themes that have already been um, spoken about. So one of those was intent. Uh, and at the Jubilee Centre, as well as a, a broader focus on education, we're really interested on in um, working with schools and working with other educational providers to think about and think through who we want our children to be and young people to be, what they can be and what they can become. So it's very much about working with um, young people's abilities and qualities and having a positive and hopeful vision of what they might become. And one of the key um, elements of character education, it's one of those terms that is often used, but often sort of ill-defined, but is about relationships. So relationships are central to character education and character is at the heart of positive and, and hopeful relationships. And also that connects with providing a space and a schooling environment and education environment in which young people feel safe and can feel that they belong. And through the presentation, particularly with regards to the last two, uh, aspects. We'll say something about our work with schools and the role of schools that have really embedded and developed character education in relation to providing that, that safe uh, environment and um, a sense of belonging. And I guess I should say from the outset that character education might not provide the whole solution to the various challenges facing young people and facing education today, but hopefully it can provide part of the solution. And hopefully in my presentation, I'll speak about how it might do that and particularly perform uh, or provide a foundation as a, and a basis for discussions around some of the key issues um, involved. But before we get to character education, it's absolutely um, essential, I think, to, to say that actually all educators are character educators. And to some extent, character education is good education. So when we think about our aims of ed education, and actually these are some of the things that most teachers tell us uh, at the center, this is why they joined the profession in the first place. I used to be a teacher and that's certainly one of the reasons I joined the profession, but it's the commitment that every child is educable, that educational institutions cannot form fully educated human beings alone. So education is a, is a key factor in young people's character development and their wider socialization, but obviously it doesn't operate alone, it operates in relation to families, to the media, to peer groups, to other aspects of socialization. And that it's only through the trials of life that someone could be fully educated. And I think that trials of life is absolutely uh, essential and an understanding and helping young people to mediate and tra traverse those trials of life 
And uh, our director uses the phrase that uh, education shouldn't be about a life of tests. It should be about helping young people to deal with the tests of life. And then that character education is not a simple idea or character is not a simple idea, but it's rather a very complex aggregate of ideas, deeds, tendencies and habits. And I'll say a bit more about what character education is in a second. And crucially, that that aggregate varies with each individual. So it's not about um, you know, putting people in a straitjacket or moulding them in all in the same sense and in a fixed identity. It's about working with young people to understand their own identities, their own life worlds, their own needs, their own qualities, and working with them at that individual um, level. And one final point there is the, um, the point commonly made around character education is that we're all character educators, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not. So we're all working, when we work with young people in an educational setting or indeed wider settings, we're all influencing that young person's character. We're all imparting aspects of our own character on young people. So it's about taking an intentional and explicit approach and being cognizant about how our character affects young people and how we're supporting young people to develop um, their character. So just a couple of other points um, that the goal of human life is to develop essential excellences, the potentialities that define and constitute a life worth living. And I think that's absolutely crucial, that point about a life worth living. I'm working with young people when we talk to school leaders and when we work with schools that have um, deeply embedded character education. They often talk about belonging. They often talk about relationships, but they often talk about a sense of purpose and giving young people or working with young people to develop their sense of purpose. And I'll say something about that in more detail at the end of the presentation. And at the center, we take what's called a neo-Aristotelian view. So this is a view that character and, and our view about virtues uh, comes from Aristotle, but it's updated uh, uh, for the contemporary context. So it's like a repackaged version of Aristotle's work. Um, and Aristotle said, our examination is not to know what virtue is, but is to become good. So character education is fundamentally about what it means to be a good person and striving to do that. And that's hard, you know, it's not simple. It's not simple for young people. It's not simple for us as adults. So not a simple process in terms of, well, this is what it means to be a good person. And it's easy, you know, here are the clear steps to do that. But it's engaging in discussion, experience, reflection, um, and a range of other processes to think about what it means to be good and then to try and become good um, as people. So what is character education? Excuse me. Well, character can be defined as a set of personal traits or dispositions that evoke specific emotions. So it involves emotions, it involves motivation, uh, that inform motivation and also guide our conduct. So absolutely crucial there is how our character guides our conduct. Character education is a, an umbrella term for the explicit and implicit educational activities that help young people to develop positive personal traits that are called virtues. So we would use the term virtues. Um, and these are what we're trying to educate young people and uh, indeed ourselves, or give opportunities for young people to develop their virtues, to reflect on their virtues, and also to express their virtues, whether in educational settings or beyond in their wider lives. So the Jubilee Centre uh, has a model, our framework, again, it's linked in the, in the final slide with references, um, and we talk about the building blocks of character. And for analytical ease, we divide um, types of character into four main blocks. So firstly, there are intellectual virtues, moral virtues, and civic virtues, and performance virtues, practical wisdom, and then the, the goal, the ultimate goal, is flourishing individuals and flourishing society. So let's look at those in a bit more detail. So intellectual virtues, these are the character traits necessary for discernment, for right action, pursuit of knowledge, truth and understanding. So here we're working with young people and schools are working with young people to develop autonomy, critical thinking, curiosity, judgment, reasoning, reflection and so on. Moral virtues for us as Aristotelians, this is absolutely crucial. I mean, to some extent, moral virtues are the glue that hold the other types of virtues um, together. So these are character traits that enable us to act well in situations that require an ethical response. So this is working with young people and teachers and educators uh, to develop compassion, courage, honesty, integrity, justice, respect, uh, and so on. 
civic virtue. So these are the character traits that are necessary for engaged and responsible citizenship and crucially contributing to the common good. So working with young people to understand how, whether they feel connected, connected to their communities, whether that's the school community, the wider community, or indeed local, national, global communities and how they can contribute and how they do contribute to um, organizations and societies and collectivities that are beyond themselves so it's about looking beyond oneself so these these uh, examples are civility community awareness service and uh, volunteering and then lastly and, and this is um uh, sort of the performance virtues and actually there's been a huge focus as you'll know on performance virtues within education, particularly um, you know, Angela Duckworth's book on grit, resilience, commonly used by the Department for Education, determination, perseverance. And we would say that performance virtues are character traits that have an instrumental value. So performance virtues aren't a good thing in and of themselves. And the, the standard example that we might use for this is a, a, a burglar or a robber who's resilient or a criminal who's, uh, who perseveres and who's motivated. So these things aren't good in themselves, but performance virtues are important in when they're directed and when they enable the intellectual, moral and civic virtues. As uh, good Aristotelians, um, we place a huge amount of importance on what Aristotle called phrenesis. Um, it's been translated as good sense or practical wisdom. So practical wisdom is what's called the integrative virtue. So this is a meta virtue developed through experience and critical reflection. And this enables us to perceive, know, desire and act with good sense. So this includes discerning deliberative action in situations where virtues collide. There's a couple of things to say here about phrenesis. Now, unlike some other approaches in, in this broad sphere of personal and social development, such as positive education and the positive psychology movement, or social and emotional aspects of learning, um, they, those would, would uh, include some sense of wisdom um, or judgment, but they would see it as just one element you know, or one quality um, similar to other qualities, so sort of on a similar level. But Aristotle and the Neo-Aristotelian framework positions phrenesis and this idea of good sense, practical wisdom, over and above the other virtues. So it's sort of a meta-virtue. And crucial as well is the importance of phrenesis for teacher judgment. So when we work with schools with deeply embedded character education, they talk a, a good deal about the importance of teachers and school leaders developing their own phrenesis and developing their own good sense, their own practical wisdom. We know a lot uh, of pressure in education uh, and educational policy that have acted to take away the autonomy and the judgment of teachers. So really this is about teachers and young people using their judgment in given situations to look at the situation look at the context and think about well how would i act how should i act what is the right thing to do at the right time and for the right reason but we also have to be forgiving with this unlike some other moral development theories this isn't necessarily a clearly staged approach where we know very clearly how to get better at practical wisdom but we develop practical wisdom throughout all our lives and we you know hit the bumps um, and we, you know, it's a bit like snakes and ladders as you go, so up some ladders and down some snakes, and particularly for young people, and particularly for young people who are vulnerable, other pressures, context plays a key role in their ability or the constraints on them showing good sense and practical wisdom. So there's a clear role here for forgiveness and understanding, compassion, as Nadia was talking about, to try and help young people to navigate their life, to try to make um, good decisions, to try to use their practical wisdom, but also to understand that, that this isn't easy, even as adults. And practical wisdom plays a particularly key role where virtues might collide. So where compassion might um, collide with honesty or, or, or whatever. So phrenesis helps us to adjudicate where two decisions or two virtues might be in conflict, where there are different courses of action um, available. Now, from an educational point of view, we argue, and the Jubilee Centre's framework includes, that character education is caught, taught and sought. So what does that mean? Well, character is caught where the school community of both staff and students provide the example, culture and inspiration and influence in a positive, a positive ethos that motivates and promotes character development. Now, from a leadership perspective, again, when we talk to school leaders, 
the working character education, they say that court is primary. So although we, character taught and character sought is essential, actually it's character court. But without this school ethos and this community of providing the example, the culture and inspiration and influence, um, the other, the taught and the sought can't fall into place. So character court, absolutely essential. We'll say something a bit more about that in terms of leadership in a bit. Character taught uh, is where the school provides educational experiences in and outside of the classroom that equip students with the language, the knowledge, understanding and skills that enable character development. So absolutely, this doesn't mean, you know, unlike other subject areas, doesn't necessarily mean that children receive taught classes in, or today we're teaching compassion, or today we're teaching honesty, although they may do. And um, the Jubilee Centre's uh, site, a website, has lots of curriculum resources, but also examples from schools about how they embed character and the vocabulary and language of character, which again we'll come to in a few slides, within their taught, um, their taught curriculum. But one of the key goals of character, uh, and why I think it's resonant for today's themes, is that character also should be sought. So character is something that hopefully within a positive schooling environment and a positive and supportive environment um, that young people seek for themselves. So character sought is that school provides varied opportunities that generate the formation of personal habits and character commitments. These help students over time to seek desire and freely pursue their character development. And if I take an example from a school we work very closely with in Hampshire, and this is a primary school, and um, the head teacher there spoke at length about the, the way that for those young children, even children in, um, you know, in reception in year one, the, the vocabulary and the language and the focus and the ethos, that supportive environment within the school means that the children, they've witnessed a, a transformation over two or three years of the children themselves, young children um, seeking and desiring to freely pursue these virtues, obviously at, at, at an age appropriate level, but they're seeking to be kind, to be honest, et cetera, and they're using that vocabulary. And again, I'll give some more examples uh, from secondary schools um, in a second. So let's focus on uh, character education and leadership. So, so far as um, character education and leadership is concerned, it's fundamentally about creating the conditions and the context for character formation, starting with leaders and leadership. It's now um, fairly common within the literature on uh, character education that leadership is absolutely central and is the key. And that leadership starts obviously with school principals and head teachers and senior management teams, but then uh, permeates down to staff, to young people, to, uh, to other colleagues um, who work within an educational setting, schools or, or otherwise. And I think this is one of the key challenges when we've spoken to schools. So a prime example would be King, King's Langley School. Um, and the, uh, the, the head teacher there, or the former head teacher there, a gentleman called Gary Lewis, who's um, done a huge amount of work. He's now the chair of the Association for Character Education. And when he took, he's one of those stories, when he took over the school uh, as head teacher years ago, it was a school where the pupils weren't proud of the school. It had a very poor reputation in the community. Gary speaks at length in terms of the work he had to do to start with teachers. So not starting with pupils, but starting with teachers to understand how teachers are engaging with young people and whether teachers were providing positive role models, creating positive relationships. So creating those conditions for character formation absolutely starts with leaders, but also then permeates down through staff and then into and through the pupils themselves. So just some thoughts around character education and leadership. Again, fundamental within the literature, but also within the practice of um, school leaders who deeply embedded character education is the recognition that educators and educational institutions may need to change. Again, another example, so this is a secondary school in Kent that we worked with very closely uh, called Aylesford School. And uh, the leadership there, again, a school that, um, that had severe behavior problems uh, and issues, um, had a very low reputation in the community, undersubscribed, you know, successive um, poor Ofsted reports, a whole range of um, issues. And that school and the school leaders um, uh, two or three years ago, sat down and said, right, we, you know, we're just on the treadmill of new initiatives, new things. What can we do to deeply embed and have a sustainable model for developing positive relationships 
um, and a positive, you know, making the school a positive environment and one that's well received within the community, but also for the pupils uh, and by the pupils. And an example they use is just the amount of negative text messages that they would send home um, to pupils and to parents. Um, and it, it, these were sort of running in the thousands and just the negative culture um, within the school. Another example of that negative culture was the, um, was the punitive uh, behavior system in the school with sanctions and levels and, and detentions. And, but these were things that were never working. And the, the answers to date had always been about, well, let's just have more, let's have a higher sanction, let's have a more uh, tougher sanction, let's have more punitive measures, let's have more detentions. So the example, one of the senior leaders there who's in charge of the leads on character education uh, and behavior said is that, um, you know, we were having after school detentions and we were having weekend detentions, just this sort of more and more detentions, even though uh, they weren't working. And they fundamentally shifted. Um, they do say that it got worse before it got better, but they fundamentally shifted to a character based approach, a restorative approach, where young people were clear on the behavior that was expected, but also why that behavior was expected, and that the positive behavior, character based approach, was then rewarded. So that's Aylesford School. Um, in Kent. We also um, work very closely with schools and understand how schools seek to move their vision into ethos and climate. So they do this in a range of ways, whether it's through relationships, whether it's through having a very clear set, you know, a community developed set of virtues. Now, some schools will have three uh, main virtues that they focus on. So they turn these virtues perhaps rather than values uh, and just the difference between values and virtues. Um, a prime example, somebody once used that I thought was a good idea is that I may value uh, healthy eating, um, but I might not practice that myself. Whereas with a virtue, um, it doesn't make sense to say I value, or I, I have the virtue of honesty. It's something I possess, something I try and seek um, to demonstrate. So virtue is, is fundamentally about something we seek to possess and we seek to, to enact uh, in our lives. So it doesn't really matter. Some schools have three main virtues, some have 10, some have as many as 12, but th these are developed by with the community um, and give a sense of what's important, but also provide a shared moral vocabulary. And I think that's absolutely fundamental that the schools we work with and what we've learned from schools, that shared moral vocabulary is fundamentally important, not just in terms of day-to-day -day management of um, behavior, but as we'll say um, in, in the next slide, uh, when stress points, when particular stress points um, occur. Again, I think one thing we hear time and time again is about the challenging um, and adapting some existing practices. So where uh, a character education approach is taken by a school, often this can lead to quite significant tensions within staff. And some staff um, won't appreciate that, uh, obviously pupils as well and parents, but the schools tell us and the senior leaders tell us that over time, people are on board. So, so that they start to see the benefits. Now that needs a supportive environment, but it does lead to some challenging situations. Now that might be because, um, you know, that the certain approaches, particularly more punitive approaches, have a clearer structure than initially perhaps a character-based approach might do, even just for, for sort of low level um, behavior and disruption. But can also be that where particular stress points occur, there's a real test of the strength and the commitment to a character education approach. So another school that we work with, a teacher, there, the senior leader there, always uses the example of a, of a um, head of department who was part of the school's SMT and, uh, you know, was on board with everything until a pupil um, overstepped the mark and uh, they wanted the pupil, you know, banned from going to a, a school trip that was quite important for their GCSE coursework. And the school absolutely resolute and saying that's against what we stand for now. Two years ago, we would have done that, but we don't do that now. And it led to some tension and some sort of negotiation between the staff member and the senior, le uh, senior leadership team. So character education also requires a distributed leadership style, but also cultivating leadership. Now, one thing that character education schools seek to do is to try and make leaders of, uh, of their pupils uh, and, and develop and cultivate the leadership strength of all pupils. Now, I know a range of schools do this, but it's absolutely fundamental to a character-based um, approach. And there's a, actually it was a, another senior member of staff at King Langley School who said their goal is that every pupil in the school will have a leadership um, badge or you know will have a role, leadership role to, in some way. Um, and, and every child will, will be recognized for what they can bring and what they can lead on. 
This is just a, um, a, a sort of a heads up, and Aidan will say more about this in, in our um, breakout session, about a CPD programme. So this is free, you just need to sign up on the Jubilee Centre's website. And here are some colleagues from schools that we've worked with. Um, and this is about leading character education in schools. So um, there's many videos with practitioners talking about their experiences that touch upon and go into much more detail about some of the things I've said so far in the presentation. And then just in the, in the few minutes left, I just wanted to talk about character education and justice from a leadership um, pers uh, perspective. So I think firstly, it's just that constant positive and hopeful vision. So going back to that intent that I mentioned at the start of the presentation, when we speak to school leaders and when we work with school leaders that take a character education approach, they often talk about the need and that they had in their school and the benefits, now whether those benefits are about um, behaviour, about attendance, about staff well-being, about academic attainment, whatever it might be, but the shift from a confrontational, perhaps more negative, um, sanction-based approach to a more consistent, positive and hopeful vision. But that, that's required quite a lot of change. Again, I, um, this was a senior leader um, who we went to visit and they'd run a, a successful school um, and been asked to take secondary school and been asked to be the executive head and um, to support the, um, the development of a school that had struggled for a number of years, a challenging environment. This was in London. Um, and uh, the, the teacher, he's a, the current school had said, um, her teacher, that you know, uh, they'd had a character education embedded for, for a long time. He said one of the key things he noticed when he went to the other school and they started working with teachers at the other school is that at his, his school, um, they had a sense of it's up to us to create the conditions in which we can support young people. Whereas at the new school um, that they were working with, the staff had a mindset there that it was up to the pupils to change. So rather than saying, well, what have, what have we done as staff and what could we do as staff to make this either to um, manifest the negative behaviour in the pupils and the, and, or to um, mediate that negative behaviour, they had sort of a slightly different mindset. So often it's about changing that mindset to provide that belonging and that safe space. Um, character education as a foundation, um, including um, stress points. Uh, so I think again here, just a, an example, I won't name the school, but this was a school deeply embedded, character education deeply embedded. Uh, and they had a, a student who, um, secondary student, uh, I think it was a year 10, who'd had um, serious problems, was involved in a local gang, um, and you know was was vulnerable, but was also you know at risk of being excluded and all sorts of um, tensions and uh, and issues. And the schools were the school was trying to work with them, this this student, and things had been going okay. Uh, and then one day the um, the student got in a, a, a fight. Uh, I think it was in the canteen at school, and the um, assistant head teacher um, went to break up the fight, and the student hit um, the, um, the the assistant head teacher. It wasn't badly hurt, but, but obviously. Um, sort of physically hit the uh, teacher and that led to a lot of soul searching um, in the school um, for that assistant head teacher and, and the school leader and the school leader said very clearly that you know we can exclude we don't accept this but and the, the assistant head teacher said well no that sort of undermines our character-based approach so it doesn't mean that there wasn't any sanctions and it was forgotten etc but but it did mean that the character education provided a foundation that they had that shared vocabulary to act as an anchor for thinking through decisions as i said that doesn't necessarily mean that the decision was always going to be that the, the pupil wouldn't be excluded it didn't mean that there wouldn't be sanctions and uh, uh, and follow up, but it did mean that there was at least a, a vocabulary. We find this in other aspects uh, as well, particularly when schools are going through very challenging times or or dealing with very challenging events. But that shared vocabulary, that strong sense of ethos and the relationships, can provide that sort of um, that anchor to to talk through and to uh, to deal with some of these these various challenges. Character education clearly involves partnership working, but also involves connecting with young people's uh, life worlds. I think it's absolutely crucial. It's about thinking through for young people themselves, not just what does it mean to be compassionate, what does it mean to be honest, but for this pupil in this context, in their life world, what does it mean for them? Where, you know, where do the conflicts arise for them? Where do the challenges um, arise? And one thing we know from schools and from various research is that that often or sometimes behavior can be domain specific. So they might be presenting uh, behaviors um, in one context that they would be very different to the behaviors they present and the actions they present 
in other contexts. And um, reflecting on that with young people is absolutely um, key. And I also wanted to just say before I end, I'm just conscious of time, uh, about this notion of a protective effect. Now, I took this notion of a protective effect from um, some research on exclusions um, undertaken by it's part of a, a largely funded project, looking at exclusion approaches and policies um, across all four nations of, uh, of the United Kingdom. And um, this is McCluskey's and her colleagues' work. And they talk about that in Scotland, the protective effect of good education experience and of a positive school ethos was repeatedly noted by Scottish interviewees as one of the key drivers in reducing um, exclusions. And they talk very clearly about the sense in which in, in Scotland and their policy on schools and schools exclusion, that this is all seen as part of the same package, that, that a positive working environment, positive relationships are the very bedrock and the platforms through which meaningful and exclusion policies um, and policies for pupils with vulnerabilities develop and, and can be located within. And they challenge whether that actually happens in England, where the policy perhaps they say is more punitive. But I think that protective effect also works in another way. So schools often will be working within, with and against those official approaches, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But they, schools are also working absolutely diligently and hard to act as a protective effect against the wider lives of pupils, whether that's to do with gangs, whether it's to do with drugs, or whatever it, it, it might be. And time and time again, when we speak to, young, uh, to school leaders, working with young people in very challenging circumstances, they talk about the role of character education in helping them to provide that protective effect where young people feel safe and, uh, and they feel that they um, belong. Just very lastly, because uh, I think I'm just um, about on time. Here's a project that uh, Aidan Thompson, my colleague, uh, ran and may say some more about in the breakout room. But this study engaged with non-stream educational providers, sought their advice and expertise in adopting a character-led teaching uh, approach to teaching in non-mainstream settings. And one of the key findings here that I think is, is really significant is that participants in non-mainstream provision showed greater indication that they had a sense of purpose in life. Um, than those in mainstream settings. So I think that's absolutely key, key, that it's about working with young people and part of character education is supporting young people to reflect, to work on, to try and develop their good sense in developing this purpose and having a sense of purpose and working towards uh, actions in accordance with their sense of purpose in life. And a final finding there, that participants categorised as having a purpose reported that family, friends, and particularly teachers and members of the community had a greater and more positive influence on their sense of living and of a good life. So just the references that I've, I've sort of mentioned throughout the talk and you might follow up uh, are on the final slides. And as I've said, just drop me an email or, or speak to the conference organizers who I'm sure can share the slides. So that's, that's my end, Sean. Do I hand back over to you? You do indeed, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, that was again very, very engaging and very thoughtful. Um, our next presenter uh, is uh, Dr. Grace Robinson. So, if I can ask uh, Grace to come and start sharing your video, and I will pin you to the screen. Thanks, Sean. Can you see those slides? We can, yes. Fabulous. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you very much for the um, to the conference organisers for inviting me to talk today about my research. Um, my name is Grace Robinson, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about school exclusion and how exactly it harms um, children and young people. So just to give you some information about me, I completed my PhD in 2019. I'm a research fellow in the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham, where I comprise part of a research team exploring the effect of COVID-19 on child criminal exploitation and cancer lines. And I'm also director of Black Box Research and Consultancy, which is a criminal justice consultancy specializing in expert witness testimony, commissioned research and educational um, workshops. The information that I'm going to discuss with you today uh, has been taken from my current research at the University of Nottingham. My expert witness work 
but largely my PhD research. And just to provide you with some context, I'll just briefly introduce you to how exactly I've come to the findings that I have. So my research focused on gangs, county lines and child criminal exploitation. And just before I began the research in uh, 2016, there was very little published material or discussion in the wider domain surrounding child criminal exploitation. At the time, attitudes towards young people involved in gangs and drug supply were very much rooted in notions of blame and identifying young people as criminals. As it stands, county lines has become a national priority. It's constantly in the media and victims are now sometimes deservedly being treated as such rather than offenders. So from 2017 to 2018, I interviewed 28 practitioners from criminal justice organisations across Merseyside. So that included Merseyside police, youth offending teams, and I also spoke to practitioners from educational, health and third sector organisations. Importantly, I interviewed 18 gang involved young people, and that included young people who were either in a gang or associated with a gang and had family and friends in gangs as well. And they were accessed from youth offending teams, young offender institutes and alternative education providers. And for anybody not familiar with Merseyside, it's made up of five boroughs. So we've got Liverpool, Mosley, St. Helens, Sefton and Wirral. Like many other urban cities and industrial areas, it suffered from deprivation and poverty with long term and deep rooted issues of unemployment. In 2009, just as I completed the research, 16 areas across Merseyside featured on the 100 most deprived across England. So of the 18 gang involved young people that I interviewed, all of them were male between the ages of 14 and 20. All of them were from or residing in areas heavily affected by deprivation and poverty. They were repeat offenders or had offended at some point and therefore were under um, the provision of youth justice services. And the most common offence type that I came across was possession with intent to supply class A drugs, and they were usually heroin and crack cocaine. All 18 young people had been victimised in the form of really extreme violence. So many of them had been assaulted, many of them had been stabbed, and a lot of them had witnessed violence on other people. All of them had participated in drug supply, and all of them had been subjected to some form of exploitation. But most important for the discussion this morning and in keeping with the theme of today, 100% of the children in my research have been excluded from mainstream school. So just to provide you with some context about county lines and child criminal exploitation, we still have no agreed policy definition of child criminal exploitation but it has become widely recognised as a form of modern slavery and it comprises of the coercion, the manipulation and the force of children to participate in criminal acts. The most prevalent form of child criminal exploitation that we have in the UK has been identified as county lines and in its most simplest form, sorry, county lines is the trafficking of drugs um, such as heroin and crack cocaine to different areas across the country in order to increase customer bases and profit margins and avoid rising levels of violence and competition that we are seeing in other urban cities. Council lines isn't new. In fact, it's been happening for decades. So too has the exploitation of children. The reason why it's become a national priority is because of the increasingly young age of those involved and the occurrences of extreme violence that we are hearing about on a daily basis. According to the National Crime Agency, as many as 30 to 50 children can be involved in any single county line, with approximately 91% of those involved being male. And that roughly equates to around 50,000 children affected by county lines alone. And that's before we even begin to look at other forms of criminal exploitation or even sexual exploitation. So the profiles of the victims of child criminal exploitation and I will just say that we don't have one specific type of young people that can be exploited. Every single young person can be exploited. However, they usually consist of very, very vulnerable children. So those that have experiences of trauma, 
from deprived backgrounds in insecure accommodation or under the care of the local authority and often affected by mental health issues and learning difficulties. Significantly, the vast majority of victims are in pupil referral units, alternative provision, or not in any education, employment or training. And it's these vulnerabilities that perpetrators take advantage of because all they have to do is provide an unmet need to that child. So these are uh, some quotes that are taken from the young people in my research. And largely they had experienced family dysfunction in the shape of absent parents, neglect, lack of affection, lack of boundaries, and also mental illness and drug abuse in the home. Together, all of these issues impacted upon their ability to conform to the rules of mainstream school and succeed academically. Because of what was happening at home, they just could not concentrate when they sat in school and they just hadn't got what it took to be able to sit there and do the work for eight hours a day. Rejection was deep rooted for these children and followed them throughout their educational life. And by the time they reached alternative provision, they'd been excluded from a number of mainstream schools and exhausted other options of people referral units as well. And because they were often leading peripatetic lives, often changing schools and moving to different local authorities, they had very few long-term friends who they could trust and they struggled to form an identity. So they would act up in school, they would act up in order to gain attention, or they would use violence and fighting as a way to demonstrate their masculinity and increase their status and reputation in an environment where they were very, very insignificant. During interviews, they commonly identified themselves as wild or bad and naughty, labels which they'd likely been given by authority figures and internalized and began to live up to. They basically had nothing to offer and nobody had anything to offer them in return. And I've only provided three quotes here, but this was a consistent finding across all 18 young people that I spoke to. The most up-to-date government statistics that I could find were from a report in 2019. And it was reported that during the 2017 and 2018 school year, 7,900 children were excluded from school. And that equates to around 42 children per school day or 21 children every single day. We've essentially been living in a society that has responded to the awkward children by removing them and palming them off rather than helping them and by criminalizing them rather than counseling or coaching them. It costs anything up to 25,000 pounds to send a young person to a people referral unit and 5,000 pounds to keep them in mainstream school. 78% of excluded children either had special educational needs, were classified as in need, or were eligible for free school meals. And 11% of those excluded children had all three of these characteristics, so extremely vulnerable children. And it's no surprise that only 7% of excluded children go on to achieve good passes in English and maths GCSEs. Because what chances have they got when we send them to institutions surrounded by negativity and stigma? And what behaviour can we expect from children when we place them in environments surrounded by challenging behaviour, surrounded by complex behaviour, and when they internalise these ideas that they are naughty, bad and wild? So as school exclusions have been rising, so too have occurrences of violence, knife crime and child criminal exploitation. And we can see the rises in child criminal exploitation by looking at the National Referral Mechanism statistics. And for anybody that doesn't know, the National Referral Mechanism is the framework in place in the United Kingdom for potential victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. At the end of 2019, criminal exploitation was the most commonly recorded form of labour exploitation in the UK for children and young people. In that year alone, there were just under 50% of those referrals for children and young people, and that equated to around 5,000 referrals. Today, 
I am going to personify one of those statistics for you and tell you about the story of Sam. So Sam grew up in a heavily deprived area in Liverpool with his mum and his younger brother. He never met his father, but he was exposed to his mum's physically abusive boyfriend from the age of eight. Around the age of 12, in his first year of high school, Sam began to display signs of confrontation and aggressive behaviour, characteristics that he had learned and embraced as a coping mechanism and form of self-protection. The response to Sam's behaviour was to constantly send him out of the classroom and then permanently exclude him from school towards the end of his first year. Between the ages of 12 and 15, Sam attended three different mainstream schools, one pupil referral unit, and one alternative education provider. And he was often moved around by local authorities because of the risks to both himself and his family's safety. When I met Sam, he was 17 and he was living in a hostel. He was well-spoken, he was polite, he was respectful, and he was extremely intelligent. And he was over the moon because he just gave himself a place at college. Albeit it was his third college place, but he did state that he'd settled in well and he didn't want anything to disrupt his education. Because he'd received no counselling or therapy or rehabilitation to deal with his prior trauma and abuse, Sam often tried to forget the trauma by um, using substances, particularly cannabis and cocaine. And whilst living in this hostel in the summer of 2019, he began to buy small quantities of drugs from two Somalian men who congregated outside of this hostel. He'd been purchasing drugs for a few weeks when these drug dealers began to supply him with more drugs than he'd actually asked for. Knowing full well that he was vulnerable and had issues with drugs, knowing full well that he would accrue a drug debt, and also knowing full well that he would have no way of paying this drug debt off. So again, a few weeks passed and, and Sam kept approaching these drug dealers. And one day they turned around and said, you owe us £2,000 for the drugs that we've given you. And they made threats to Sam, they made threats to his family, and he'd witnessed violence that they'd inflicted upon other people. So he began making drops for them. And he was making drops of crack cocaine and heroin to other drug dealers. A few months later, around October 2019, and having been on the waiting list for housing for quite some months, Sam was placed in a flat in a neighbouring borough a few miles from where his exploitation had taken place. He was again absolutely over the moon because he thought this would be his way out, it would be a fresh start, and he would be away from those exploiters who were forcing him to deal drugs. However, he quickly learned that the new block of flats that he'd been placed in was plagued by antisocial behaviour, by gang violence, and by class A drug use. And the same Somalian drug dealers also supplied drugs to the individuals in that block of flats. Now his flat was on the ground floor. The, the fob to the main entrance was broken and he also had no locks on the windows. So anybody could get in and rightly so, Sam became worried about his safety. Drug users would also come and go. They would knock on his door. They would ask him for money, ask him for food um, and also inform him that there were individuals looking for him. And around November 2019, Sam began to write to his housing officer. In emails, he stated that he was fearful of his life, that the flat was in no condition for anybody to live in. There was no locks. He stated all this in these emails. And he also told them that he'd become very anxious and depressed and started to stutter again, something which he hadn't been affected by since he was in school. So during to, um, November and December 2019, there were a stream of emails to this housing officer. In the very last email, Sam stated he feared for his life, he was desperate to move, and he needed help and support. Sam received no replies to these emails, not one reply. And in January of last year, 
he was on his way to meet his family on foot when he was approached by two masked men and stabbed five times in his leg. He described one of the attackers coming from the front and stabbing him in the right thigh and another of the attackers coming from behind, strangling him from behind and stabbing him four times in the back of his leg. Luckily for Sam, he was able to run off and he ran into the road and found one of his friends who was driving and asked to be taken to the hospital. And when he got to the hospital, police who were dealing with another incident at the very same time, spoke to Sam by his bedside and tried to interview him. But he wasn't on his own. There were under other individuals from his area, some of his friends also around his bedside. And Sam didn't feel comfortable disclosing any of the information about the attack because children and young people are so scared of being labelled as a grass or a snitch. So police left him to it. He didn't cooperate and they never tried to make contact with him again about this incident. And upon leaving the hospital, Sam went to stay in the hostel that he had originally been living in. And the reason being there was 24 hour security and even though those attackers congregated outside his hostel, he felt safer because of that security and because there was locks on the doors and because there was locks on the windows. A couple of weeks went past and Sam decided to walk to the shop and lo and behold, he was again approached by these exploiters. This time they weren't only, weren't only making threats to his life, they were making threats to his daughter's life. And he'd recently had his baby girl. So again, feeling like he had no choice and wanting to protect both himself and his family, Sam began to make drops for these individuals and he was arrested four weeks later on possession with intent to supply class A drugs, then trying to demonstrate that the, he had been a victim of modern slavery. Unfortunately for Sam, the police are disputing that he was a, a victim of exploitation and they are actually trying to pin on him that the, he played a serious role in the offence. And their reason for this was that Sam did not cooperate with the police, he did not seek their protection, and he did not present with a young person living in fear. Of every single young person that I spoke to during that research, and every single person that I've spoke to since, they have never had the slightest belief that they would be protected by the police and they've always been more scared of the people exploiting them than they are of the police and any subsequent prison sentence. So what can we learn from Sam's story? Firstly, that during every interaction with somebody that could have helped Sam, he was met with a lack of support and a punitive response. He was failed by school, he was failed by the local authority, he was failed by his housing officer, and he was also failed by the police. Secondly, that every exploited child and young person does have a choice, but those choices are often between going hungry or engaging in drug supply, or being victimized through quite extreme violence, or complying with the orders of other individuals who are exploiting them. And I found that children and young people will do just about anything to minimize their pain and suffering. Sam's story is not a one-off and I come across cases like this every single day. Like so many other children, Sam's story was a serious case review waiting to happen. And I know that I've gone off on quite a bit of a tangent there, but we need to do something as a society um, about school exclusion because we can't keep excluding and failing 42 children per day. Exclusion seriously harms children in more ways than one. It induces feelings of rejection, it lowers their aspiration, it lowers their self-worth and it's both a symptom and cause of mental illness. It's the perfect storm for involvement in crime it's the perfect storm for involvement in violence and it's the perfect storm for perpetrators like those in Sam's case to take advantage in any way that they see fit. So what did Sam deserve and what could have been different for him? Sam deserves to be able to rely on a system that is 
essentially supposed to support and protect children and young people. He also needed early intervention. He needed help dealing with his deprivation, dealing with the fact that he was living in poverty. He needed help dealing with the rejection of not having a father. He needed to heal from his experiences of abuse and trauma. And he needed educating on addiction, on aggression and on violence. He needed a positive role model, especially a male role model. And he needed time, passion, uh, patience, compassion, and a trauma-informed approach, because unfortunately for Sam, his life had been comprised by trauma. I don't believe that any individual working with children and young people wants them to fail. Yet excluding 42 children per day makes situations like Sam's all that more possible. I believe that our best way forward to is to try and eradicate school exclusion. And I believe that this can be done through the points I've raised on the slides. We need to intervene when we identify a child that is struggling. We need to update the curriculum and educate young people on things that are affecting them in their world. Trauma, addiction, violence, educate them on mindfulness and on consequential thinking and how to deal with their emotions. Young people need mentors and positive role models. And it's so important that these individuals can relate to the children that they're working with. We all need to be more compassionate with these young people. We all need to be there for them when they're ready to open up because they aren't always ready. But it's so important that when they are, we are there and we're listening to them. We need to adopt a trauma-informed approach with young people because unfortunately, trauma is a language that they can understand. And instead of excluding children and sending them to people referral units or alternative provision, develop on-site inclusion units, remove the stigma and focus on the values that children are lacking. Engage parents. No parent wants to see their child fail. If you can get them on side, it's half the battle. And education must be child focused, not target driven. Ofsted ratings are so important, but they should never be placed ahead of any child's safety or progress. We need to teach children to learn from their mistakes, not to send them on a path of criminalization, because it's so much easier to help a child stay out of trouble than it is to remove them once they're involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'm sure if you've got questions, uh, any of the presenters will be happy to answer in the chat. Um, and again, thank you very much, Grace, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to go for a break uh, between now and 11.15. And then I'm hoping, fingers crossed, when you come back at 11.15, there will be links to breakout rooms that you can uh, select for your presentations. We've asked the uh, breakout presenters to speak for about half an hour, 20 to maybe 25 minutes and take questions. And then these, most of the presentations are going to be repeated twice. So if you see more than one you'd like to do, when you, after that half an hour, when you come back out the breakout rooms, the breakout rooms should hopefully be there and then you can go into another breakout room. Um, and the breakout rooms uh, should be recorded. So again, if you can't choose a particular breakout room that you would like to see that these recordings will be made available to you later. So um, I would suggest, obviously feel free to have put questions down, but I would suggest have a screen break and then come back at 11.15. Um, thank you very much. I'm not duly affected either. Um, so again, I'd like to apologize to Michael, but to everybody else about this hiccup. Um, and bear with me while we just pass over to, to Michael.
Michael, uh, when you're ready, you're, you're welcome to start and thank you. Okay, have we got everyone back now? Yes, we should have. Right, okay, thanks Sean. Um, my name's Michael Jopling, I'm Professor of Education and Director of the Education Observatory at um, Wolverhampton. Um, so thank you all for, first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for still hanging in there and for enjoying that, you know, to and fro with the breakout rooms. So that's what comes when you try and be too clever, I think. And, and if we designed you, it all would have worked, but it, it didn't quite do that. So um, it's, it's interesting how kind of te technology brings you back to the days where you didn't actually put the money in the meter, which seemed seemed like to me. So I'll, I've got some um, slides to, if I can put them up for you. Um, Right. Hopefully, you can, can you see that? Yes, we can. Good. Um, and I'm going to try and keep it to about half an hour, so um, to catch up some time. And if you haven't had time to eat anything, feel free to eat while I'm talking. Um, my, I've put an and in the title, but the, the title that, that I've got is Leading and Social Justice in Education. It's kind of a broad overview. It's kind of me working through things um, I've been thinking about recently, research we've been doing, and also some teaching of, of, you know, kind of outcomes from teaching I've been doing, working in um, both in the UK and in Germany. So one of the advantages of, of the current situation is quite easy to do some kind of online teaching in other countries and learn from that as well. So the overview, what I'm going to talk about is um, I've got a prologue, which includes two people called Williams, one called Smith, and uh, that should say Turning Point, but I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. Um, social justice or social mobility. Uh, a little bit about a small scandal, um, a word I think we should use more and a word I think we need to lose. And then finally, a little bit about leading social, social justice post COVID, because that's obviously the context we're in and something we need to focus on. So the first Williams is, I'd never expected to be quoting from the former Archbishop of Canterbury, but you know, never look a gift horse in the mouth. What he wrote recently in the New Statesman a couple of weeks ago is that, um, Education, he's, he was talking, he's talking about education, educational issues being a lightning rod over the last year or so. And he said that education at every level is still seen predominantly in terms of providing employable skills and its effectiveness is routinely measured by success in securing jobs. But what if we're now at a point in the history of our culture when this is not just inadequate, but actively disabling? Now, um, I'm just gonna move the thing to the top of the screen. Doesn't wanna do that, all right, there we go. What that I mean, that seems an interesting thing to, to think about anyway. But then just after that occurred last week, there were these headlines which appeared um, about loss, which you may have seen. Lost school time could cost pupils £40,000 in earnings, um, which which appeared almost at the same time as you said that. Right? I'll come back to that later on as a kind of slightly alarming um, headline in terms of uh, thinking about particularly about disadvantaged students, vulnerable young people, and you know, and also just um, potentially, potentially causing anxiety among, among individuals about what's going to happen. The next person I'm going to refer to is Raymond Williams um, and ladders, because ladders come up all the time in this. Ladders are an interesting kind of um, symbol in terms of social justice and social mobility, particularly. And this has been, this, I think it's a particularly British thing. But, and, and an English thing even within that. But I think um, what Raymond Williams back in 1958 talked about, talking about meritocracy, is that he, he talked about ladders being the prime symbol. Um, and his point in, you know, nicely phrased, was that, that talking about a ladder weakens community in the task of common betterment, and particularly nicely put, sweetens the poison of hierarchy. And this was in um, a, a review he wrote of uh, Michael Young's original book on meritocracy, which has become, you know, uh, a kind of controversial, originally written as a satire, but kind of became interestingly part of policy ever since. Bringing that kind of up to date with um, David Goodhart's book that came out last year, he talks about, in the UK at least, getting on often means a ladder out and leaving your roots behind. You have to leave to achieve. So this is the part that, you know, if, we, if we're focusing on um, issues of social mobility, particularly, but also social justice, often in a UK context, and perhaps even more so in an English context, it means leaving, leaving your kind of communities um, or being stuck. And, you know, we get into all of the kind of issues around the last election, what happened in the so-called um, red wall areas, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this, the, the Smith I'm gonna quote from, 
um, is Zadie Smith, the kind of novelist, and who's just brought a book of essays out, published last year, um, which talk about the lockdown and everything. Um, it's, it's, it's worth reading in itself. But what she says, which is which I think is worth thinking about, is that um, this is talking about the, Mer the American context because this was before the the election last year. She said that no one in 1945 wished to return to the old life, to return to 1939. And I think. Um, She's talking about the fact there that this is an opportunity with lockdown for a new kind of new start. People talk about the new normal. I wonder if they think about really going back to what was what it was like before. Um, and it's a challenge for all of us involved in, in any kind of education, any kind of work with children, young people to think where, how, you know, is this an opportunity to, to do things differently? Um, in when, when we talk about that kind of the, the national symbol of the Second World War, it depends, you know, different people talk about different things, but obviously what happened in 1945 was, was a huge change and an opportunity to, to rethink and kind of restructure things to, to make sure that we didn't return to the mistakes of the past. Right, I can't see the, the heading of this one now. Okay, um, four pillars of a 10 year plan for education. This was Robert Halfen, who's the head of the Education Select Committee, um, member of parliament, I was just listening to, he was being interviewed the other day and he, he was talking about the four pillars of um, how, to, how to come out of coronavirus. He talked about an A to Z route map out of coronavirus, which sure that's gonna work. But the first one that he referred to was social justice. So social justice being part of uh, one of these pillars. There's always four pillars. I don't know why they have to be four. It's something to do with architecture maybe. The other three were standard skills and support for the professions. Um, but it's interesting to see that the social justice, rather than social mobility, was the, the kind of the first of those pillars that, that he was emphasizing being particularly important. Um, and there's a question here is that how do we balance these things? So, so social justice against social mobility. Social mobility has been the kind of phrase that, that, that the government has been um, emphasizing for the, you know, the last 10 years or so. But um, Often, you know, there are some people who say, well, actually, without social mobility, social justice won't work, but social mobility on its own may not be enough. And there's always, again, um, this is coming from a kind of blog from um, Bristol University about there's always ladders there. And ladders, I think, are, as I said, are an interesting and problematic kind of image for all this. Fine if you're, if you can progress up them, but if you're kind of stuck towards the bottom or uh, if some of the, the rungs are broken, then um, it's, it's not going to work for you. All right, so what does social justice mean? Um, there are various definitions. Uh, they usually relate to kind of equity, equality and fairness. There's kind of four or five principles usually. Uh, they're about access to resources. They're about equity, as I said, um, kind of participation. There's a human rights element to it. And then diversity is the kind of fifth principle that's come in um, in kind of definitions in more recent times. Social mobility, on the other hand, is kind of a, it's a more recent and a kind of narrower um, and more, it's more difficult to define really as a concept. Um, Exley talks about it being about um, improvement. So his definition is the chances we or our children have of attaining the aspirations that most of us hold or of living a life determined more by our effort and choices than by our background. Um, aspirations are a word to, to think of, to hold on to there. Um, and often some mobility gets focused again, particularly in, in, in a UK context on higher education progressing. Um, I've lost count of the amount of conferences I've gone to or uh, seminars where people talk about having to improve um, aspirations or improve opportunities for young people and saying it's not just about university and then they only ever focus on getting to university where, you know, at the moment we've only, we've got just over 50% of young people going to university. Um, it's not that by definition, that's, you know, roughly half are, don't go to university, we need to think about what to do about the other, give other opportunities as they do in other countries. So Michael Sendal um, says in his book, The Tyranny of Merit, which came out last year, which is worth reading, higher education has become a sorting machine that promises mobility on the basis of merit, that word again, but entrenches privilege and promotes attitudes towards successive towards success, which corrosive of the commonality democracy requires. His point there is focusing too much on, on merit, on, on kind of um, pushing and, and encouraging young people particularly to achieve and to, to move down a narrow tunnel. Um, risks 
risk that risk kind of undoing the community and the kind of working together that is part of as he says part of democracy or, or part of society generally and i'm not going to read all of that but this goes back to the um the importance of teaching white paper that started the uh the, co the, the coalition coalition government started in uh, used to kind of start the change to education in 2010 and it's interesting there that they said that our schools should be the engines of social mobility um helping children to overcome the accidents of birth etc cetera, etc cetera. the question is 11 years on has that happened is that something that schools a should be doing or b are capable of doing given all the other challenges that we face um right so there's a question of whether social mobility is a useful term or a useful uh, focus. There's a book by um, Selina Todd, a kind of sociological historian that comes out today. I, again, she was talking on the radio the other day when she refers to social mobility as a myth. She, say, she says it doesn't exist, it's not helpful, we shouldn't focus on it. Um, there are, this is, an, this is an attempt by the World Economic Forum to, you probably can't see all, it doesn't really matter. Um, about the order of that, but it shows, it ranks countries by social mobility. And as you might guess, the first few places are in Scandinavia. So Den Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden. Um, then it stays in Western Europe. And the UK comes in at, in position number 21. So um, at the moment, if, if social mobility is an aim that we should be focusing, focusing on, then we're not, don't seem to be doing it very successfully. The other thing that related to this is about um, income, social mobility against income equality. So again, um, the UK, and we can talk about whether that's a useful term, different systems, different approaches in the different UK countries, but um, the UK comes, is, has, has quite as higher levels of income equality than other countries in Europe and has, has lower levels of, of social mobility. So there's, there's obviously an issue there's, there, there is not, not a causation, but there's kind of correlation there that might make us think um, compare. And again, it's the countries in Scandinavia, as always, that, that do well, but other, you know, Canada's up there in terms of social mobility, um, Japan as well. So it's, it's the, I'm, not, I'm not saying these comparisons, we should worry too much about them, but it's interesting to think that uh, we seem very concerned in, in our context about social mobility and it has effects, whereas we don't seem to be, um, being very successful in how we deal with it. This is the point um, that I made earlier that I'll talk a little bit about and I should acknowledge that Sally Reardon, who some of you may have been listening to talking about the quality of teaching, um, pointed this out and we've been kind of talking about this and this did some of the, 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 the checking of this kind of statistic out. It appeared on the 1st of February on the BBC saying that lost school time could cost pupils £40,000 in earnings, which as I said, is kind of a bit, of alarm, a bit alarmist. Um, when it appeared in the Times, it became will cost, so that the kind of could disappeared. And then without making any, any value judgment, by the time the Daily Mail got a hold of it, it was based on a devastating report, and it was a £350 billion lost generation. Um, if you trace it back, then this, it was a kind of rough calculation done by, um, somebody working for the Institute of Fiscal Studies. And what they've done is gone back to some research. This research showed that um, if you kind of, if you, if you crunch together lots of the data around um, additional year schooling, based particularly in, in uh, developing countries, and Colombia is the country they use quite a lot, is that if you increase um, for each extra year that somebody stays at school, this translates into roughly 8% increase. Now, and they did the kind of calculations, this becomes 40,000 pounds over a career. And if you add all of the young people who've lost uh, time in school together, then it becomes 350 billion pounds. The problem here is that there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue in the, in the research that's done because the evidence doesn't stack up. Um, doing, having an additional year uh, on top of seven or eight years schooling in, in somewhere in South America, it doesn't equate to six months lost in, in, in a British school. But also the main concern I have here is that this headline went around the media very quickly. It was all over Twitter, people kind of pointing out it's demoralizing for um, teachers, it's demoralizing for parents, particularly in the current situation we're in. And imagine if you're a young person who is 
unsure about your you know position some of the the the, the vulnerable young people we've been talking about earlier on today um what's it going to do to your kind of motivation and and so we've got to have much better discussion of uh research evidence and much more questioning i think generally of the kind of things that that get talked about because we you know basically this figure's made up it doesn't mean anything and who you know what who knows what's going to happen in the next five years never mind you know the career of any young person now right so i'm going to um the word that i'm going to suggest we need to use a bit more and a bit more and a bit differently is vulnerable and vulnerability um this picture which i've used a few times is it came from when the troubled families program was being uh, first set up about 10 years ago this came from a kind of again a newspaper i won't name the newspaper but this was their their depiction of a um of a troubled family which is just makes i don't know i think that that and it was part of a kind of quite negative view of um of how troubled families um as, as so described were depicted i think that for that young person um obviously not a kind of genuine picture but they should be commended to be able to drink smoke and, and hold a young a baby at the same time rather than being used as a kind of demonization but um what i'm saying about what i think about it's interesting that the word vulnerable is a kind of zeitgeist has, has built up around the world vulnerable about the word vulnerability vulnerable and vulnerability um it gets used all the time but again it's, it's quite a vague and nebulous term it's um it's kind of it was interesting that it's been it's, during lockdown kind of vulnerability and vulnerable uh, young people and young vulnerable students have have been talked about in a slightly different way and more frequently than before um but if you look at the research we Potter, Potter and Brotherton talk about the uh, the hybridization hybridization of both the causes and the kind of definition of vulnerability and it means it's kind of depoliticized as a notion so um it means that people kind of think they recognize what it is and think it can be identified and measured and used as a kind of term of um appropriation to a certain extent and it tends to be and it's been interesting talking to um students particularly in other countries about this because they have different views and if you have the more kind of social democratic perspective talks about vulnerability um and it will acknowledge and to some extent possibly overvalue social factors whereas kind of more more kind of uh, conservative or neoliberal view tends to see individuals as architects of their own disadvantage and this is uh this is a kind of problem i think and the way that um vulnerable and vulnerability are used kind of blames the victim and again um it's interesting in in zadie smith's book of essays she talks about contempt as a virus and she's again she's talking in a us con context but she's saying the one of when you kind of get into the the kind of discourse and 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 logic of blaming or of contempt then it makes the person being blamed the sufferer think that the symptom is the cause so what we're doing is that in the way that the the word vulnerable and the, and the kind of the phrase vulnerability has been used um has demonized to a certain extent people who who for through no fault of their own as have a kind of suffering from various disadvantages um and it's interesting to think of that in 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 relation to the kind of context that that um that Zadie Smith is is using in terms of the US I'm going to move swiftly on to save some time but what um this comes from some research that I've been involved in and what we what we're kind of suggesting is that particularly when um teachers are working with the most troubled or the most vulnerable or um the most disadvantaged students it's about um like all kind of teaching all kinds of, of research all kind of um social enterprise really it's about building relationships and um this requires teachers to kind of abandon control and reveal their own vulnerability and often um it's seen as something that to be avoided or to be suppressed so um if adults can kind of show their areas of vulnerability then it, it kind of takes away some of the stigma kind of the negativity and is a way of building trust and building relationships um in a survey we did last year of um head teachers just over half said they found it difficult to admit when they feel under pressure difficult to feel that they, and we've done some back some follow up interviews around this as well um male head teachers found that more difficult were deputy head teachers 
again, because I think because they've got less opportunity to kind of, they're in a less secure position. Um, uh, and if, if that's a position that, that teachers and head teachers are in, then um, that's the, the kind of relationship building that's important in terms of supporting vulnerable young people is gonna be more problematic. Um, and then in terms of school leaders, um, we asked, this is the leadership bit really, we, are, we said that almost, almost a third of, of, of leaders in our survey said they were unlikely or very unlikely to choose to become a school leader if they, if they were able to decide today. Um, that was similar but slightly higher than, than uh, whether they wanted to be involved in teaching. And less than half of those who wouldn't choose to be teachers today were satisfied or extremely satisfied in their job. So there's an issue here around not just um, the, the willingness of leaders particularly to show, uh, to admit that they're under pressure or admit that they feel vulnerable, but also there's a kind of dissatisfaction with the job, um, which I can understand. Right, so um, the word I think we need to, to think about and probably use less or even lose is the word aspiration that gets bandied around the, in this context. Um, a definition here is of aspiration is a student's ability to identify and set goals for the future while being inspired in the present to work towards those goals. Um, it's about ambition, all these kind of things. You hear it all the time. But um, the problem is it tends to, as Gillies said here, it tends to kind of privilege and focus on a particular, usually kind of middle-class ways of approach, uh, ways of kind of customs and ways of parenting. What Gillies says in, in a really interesting um, piece of research is that working class, the kind of thing that working class parents do, resourceful actions as um, she describes them, are being identified again as the cause of their disadvantage. So you're kind of doing all kinds of things, but you're being blamed for it. And um, whereas you're being kind of told off for not using the kind of resources that you don't have access to, which is problematic. Um, this is a cheap shot, but it, I don't know, there's something about that picture. It just makes me worry. But um, it's interesting that this kind of discourse of aspirations has been around for a long time, but it's become stronger and stronger. So in 2005, um, in a new Labour kind of white paper, they were talking about having the highest aspirations for every child. Um, as before uh, 2010, coalition government, schools needs to be the engines of social mobility. Um, 2012, there was talk of an aspiration nation. So aspirations became the engine of progress. So we have engines of mobility, engines of progress. Um, and then we have our then Prime Minister talk about the toxic culture of low expectations. And we have our current Prime Minister at the time talking about hard work leading to rewards. And um, that's why I couldn't resist putting that picture up, but I don't know. I probably shouldn't say any more on that. So there's a kind of, there's this accepted notion that aspirations are low, but there's, again, a bit like the kind of uh, the £40,000 earnings thing, there's no ed evidence for it. So um, we need to think about, we, 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 just, we need to kind of focus on rethinking this, um, raising aspirations. There's no evidence that shows that there is a poverty of aspiration. What, their netness, what, their, what the research evidence does show is that um, people in particular situations and disadvantaged positions have a difficulty, and young people particularly have a difficulty in realizing their aspirations. So you kind of, we need to focus more on supporting people to um, achieve the goals that they have and the goal, or, or perhaps to reconsider the goals they have, rather than, if, you, if people are considerably told, continuously told they need to raise aspirations, um, then you know, it's, you're in a kind of impossible vicious circle, really. And um, perhaps we need to think along the lines that Aparadi says, talking in a kind of um, Indian context about the, the capacity to aspire. So encouraging, in, encouraging young people, particularly the, 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 the belief that they can aspire towards doing something else. And that involves voice, um, being, able, being listened to, being able to develop a kind of cultural capacity to um, think differently about things. And that isn't the kind of rhetoric we hear all the time about the, the kind of attainment gaps and, and uh, you know, kind of meeting particular targets is a different thing. It doesn't help with this kind of 
um, what Abadurari talks about in terms of aspiration. And there's an example here, which I won't uh, read out about some research that, um, that we've been doing um, in terms of pupil premium and young people's understanding of pupil premium and what um, some students have said, said to us is that they feel very much that they're being kind of put into a, into a mold and there's a kind of uniformity there. That, so they want to be seen as individuals rather than just part of a group that needs to uh, kind of reach the targets and achieve the targets that schools are setting for them. Again, this isn't, this isn't putting blame on teachers or on schools, this is the, the situation we're in, but it's interesting that young people are very aware of the situation they're in. Um, I'm gonna whiz through that one. There's another quote here, which again, from another research project that we, that we finished last year, and it shows that um, young people, not only are they aware of what's going on in their locality, but they've got a kind of sense of um, belonging and wanting to improve their community. So this comes from a 13 year old um, involved in the Head Start research we were doing around kind of mental health, well-being, and resilience. And we got young people to talk about what it was like growing up in certain parts of Wolverhampton. Um, and they did some research with us and they, they ended up um, making a film, um, which you can find on our website if you're interested. And what uh, this, this young person said is that what I've enjoyed most is working in groups and talking about our experiences and what the city is like. Because I don't think this is just my point of view. I think that other people's point of view, unlike the other areas of the city are important, as well as other people in the group that might have a different story to me because there's always two sides to a story and it's not always ever just a bad side or a good side. And it seems, I mean, that seems to me quite a sophisticated view from a 13 year old of um, the, the different perspectives that people have on their experience. And it's, it's also kind of, it's more perceptive than, than some of the kind of the headlines that we get around issues like um, aspirations, earnings, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't want to take up too much time. Um, the question is what we do next. So there's three, again, talking coming out of research we did earlier on in towards the beginning of lockdown. Um, this was with school leaders in the Northeast. They were very clear that they wanted more trust in schools and for accountability pressures to be reduced. And there's three themes that I've just picked out here. There's, there's more themes in the actual paper that's, that'll be being published soon. One is about reduction. So we need to uh, slow things down and reduce the curriculum and focus more, they said, on community and wellbeing. Um, there's, a, there's a primary head teacher here saying that schools have, are the hubs of the community. They've been even more, they were particularly uh, even more hubs of the community during the first lockdown, remain so. And that the, the expectations and the, the demands that are made of schools don't recognize that. So it's kind of bringing things back into the community. And then there's a focus, which is this, this was a head teacher talking last summer. Um, this is an issue that obviously continues to be uh, very important about well-being. Um, we focus very much on catch up on children falling behind academically, but not about their mental well-being. So we need to think about, as, as um, she said, think about them as children rather than numbers. Um, and that's that's the pressures that we have, particularly on you know those who have difficulties um, in achieving. And the whole homeschooling thing has really put shine a, shone a light on that. We need to do something particularly around those um, young people. So there's an issue about general precarity. Again, I can't like that picture, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, two kind of, well, a couple of quotes, again, from Rowan Williams to, to finish with. I think this reflects lots of things that were said this morning, particularly in relation to um, character education. Um, he wrote, we need a courageous rethinking of our ingrained assumptions about education. We need, uh, he talks about the issue of resources for the human spirit, but this means talking, you know, he talks about broadening our vision of education. So to include drama, sport, natural world, community service, that word community again. Um, and then, so I was just gonna finish with uh, kind of five, points which relate to how we, how perhaps we need to, and this is all of us, not just school leaders, need to kind of lead um, social justice and think about social justice. So it's, I think we need to focus on capacities, capabilities and outcomes rather than just on kind of um, aspirations or expectations. 
we, I think we need to think about vulnerability as, as a, something that, that we need to see as a potential, something to encouraging people, and the kind of giving up and losing control is part of that. I think we need to stop talking about raising aspirations because it doesn't help anybody. Um, and think, as I said before, more carefully about realizing and helping people to realize aspirations. We need to listen to young people more. Our research around pupil premium is, is, is really, I think, quite striking on that, that young people have views, they want to be listened to, and they don't feel they're being listened to at, at the moment. Um, and then kind of shape education around that. And then it's about thinking plurally, about context, communities, about futures, about roots uh, with a U and roots with two O's, um, rather than giving one form of education, form of um, social justice, form of social mobility, and expecting that to work for all young people. So if we could do some of that, and I think there's, a, there's the opportunity now as, going back to that Zadie Smith quote about 1945, I think we, there's, there's an opportunity to do this. Whether it will happen, I'm, I don't know, a bit more pessimistic, but we should try, I think. Um, there are some references after that, if you're interested in that kind of thing, and we'll make them available. And I will stop there. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and again, thank you for being flexible regarding your presentation. Um, again, very insightful. Um, what we're going to do now, folks, is again, Michael will be around if you want to type in some questions. I'm sure he'll be happy to address any. We're going to take a short break and start again at 1.45. Um, and we are joined by the Regional Schools Commissioner for the West Midlands, Andrew Warren. Um, and he will be sharing his thoughts. Um, and again, happy to probably take some questions through the chat afterwards. So take a screen break uh, if you can, uh, just for 10 minutes and back at quarter two. Thank you, everyone. of the department. And then fourthly, uh, sort of what next? Though I caveat that because I'm very conscious that you folks listening are the ones on the ground who, who sort of more accurately know what's what needs to be doing and are actually the ones who are gonna make a difference. So those are the four things I want to um, say something about. But first, I just think it's important to say that if we're gonna talk about children's uh, achievement and well-being, context is absolutely key. Let me just put it in a different way. I've heard that phrase, we're all in the same boat, in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. We're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. We know that our more vulnerable families and children are having a much tougher time of it right now than their peers. We know that it likely as not, they will not only suffer more, but they will find it harder to recover post COVID. We also know that if we can get our system right for our most vulnerable children, then it's probably going to uh, um, benefit our less disadvantaged families as well. I, I remember when I was a head teacher, I was a head teacher for just under 20 years and, went, and um, some of that time I was a head teacher in Stoke-on-Trent. And, and I remember I used to remind our staff at Christmas um, just before we were about to break up. And as I was wishing them really well for a good Christmas break with their families and their friends, I would ask them to think about the children in their classes and what they would be going through for the next two week break. Some of the challenges that those families would be facing and, and some of the pressures that would happen post Christmas with the debt, which inevitably came that way. And, and what struck me, uh, and, and then, then at the start of the term, I would you know, again be reminding the staff just to be mindful of the children in their class who are more vulnerable and who would have had a really, really tough time during those two weeks. But what struck me as lockdown one was coming to an end was that this sense of disadvantage that I'd seen over a, a two week holiday period in Stoke had been magnified because we weren't talking about just two weeks. 
but we were talking about months. We're in the same storm, but we're most definitely not in the same boat. And so up front, I want to highlight the important role of our school leaders at this time. Arguably, your role, your leadership has never before been more important or more needed. Of course, leadership is always important, but it, it, it's never more important than in a crisis. And this is a crisis like never before. School leaders, you have an absolutely vital role to play in setting the school culture or the way in which we do things here. Steve Jobs famously said that culture eats strategy for breakfast and strategy is important and I'm certainly not knocking strategy, but the culture of the school is key. And this comes from the top. It is you as leaders who set that tone. Again, early on in, in one of my headships, I, I remember um, a wise mentor saying to me that um, kind of reminded me, said the mood in which you walk into the building at the start of the day will quite likely reflect the mood at which the staff leave the building at the end of the day. Culture is key, absolutely key. And so I guess it, it's good to ask what kind of a culture are we setting in our schools? And it's good to ask that particularly when I'm conscious, having spoken to so many um, school leaders over the last 10 and 11 months particularly, it's even more important to think about our culture when your own personal resources, your own personal resilience are stretched like never ever before and possibly at times even to breaking point. So I think it is good to ask these questions. Is your school a safe place for our vulnerable children? Because if you're getting it right for our vulnerable children and I'm conscious that that list of that, that number of children who are vulnerable is, is, is growing uh, through this pandemic, if you're getting it right for our vulnerable children, you are most likely also getting it right for the less vulnerable children. So, you know, how are you doing? What's your school like for, is it a safe space? Is it a place where children, uh, young people, they know they're safe? And what is it about your school that makes it safe? Sometimes good to ask that question as well. What is it about that? And if there are barriers to that, what can you do about it? I remember one of the inspections that, that um, often inspections that I had, um, it was always challenging. And as ever, you, you kind of hoping that um, the school comes out well and reflects all the good things and et cetera. You know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, I remember one of the inspectors saying to me um, in the feedback that they said that a number of children, what had moved them most was a number of children said that this is the best place they ever go to in their lives. And I found that really almost more encouraging than any other judgment that um, for our, our vulnerable children, the school was a safe place. So good to, good to ask that question. But just before I sort of go away from the importance of, of, of um, leadership, can, can I just ask this as well? Because I have learned that, you know, as leaders, you have huge influence in your, in your, um, in your communities, um, on your staff, on the parents, uh, and that too would have been a huge pressure for you over the past few months. Um, but actually, I, I've also learned that before I lead other people, I should also learn how to lead myself. Uh, and that's like an ongoing challenge. Uh, I think I'm the hardest person that I ever have to manage. Um, I have quite a large team and at various stages in, in my leadership journey, I've had even bigger teams to manage. And I remember being asked, you know, who's the hardest person you ever had to manage? Uh, and, and actually, it was an easy, I don't know whether it was a trick question, but it was an easy question to answer because the hardest person to manage was me. Um, and I've always thought before I try to lead other people, I must learn to lead myself. And what I mean by that is the way in which I manage my moods. Um, I've talked about that at the start of the day, um, watching how I go into the building, watching how I am with other people, my energy levels, my resilience levels. <clears throat> Very conscious of just how tough you, uh, it's been for you. And maybe your resilience levels have been tested beyond anything else you've ever had to deal with. Um, I, I have this kind of scale in my head on, on a sort of a one to 10, where 10 is I'm feeling really pretty strong and, and you know, bring it on. And one is I'm feeling pretty rubbish. Uh, and I've learned to one note what my resilience level is. 
and two, not beat myself up if it's not if it's a two or a three or a four, but also four. Uh, sorry, th thirdly, to kind of do something about it. So if I'm, my level is at a three and I'm not feeling in a, such a great place, it is on me. And that's part of my self-management to take. You know, what would it take? What can I do to help myself uh, kind of improve my resilience levels? So before you lead other people, it is important that you learn how to lead yourself. And part of that is looking after yourself. Uh, I'm also very conscious that our school leaders are so reaching out to their community, to their children, to their staff, checking they are, they are OK. Um, may, maybe you forget sometimes to check how you are. Um, and it's always good when I meet with chairs of governors uh, and, and trustees, I always ask them. So, um, you know, how are you looking after your, your executive team? Because if you don't look after yourself, it, it's quite likely no one else will be. Just the other point I want to make uh, before I move off this is about part of things I've learned about learning to lead myself is just checking my humility quotient. And what I mean by that is having an attitude of a learner in all that I do. Um, so the importance of leadership is absolutely critical at the moment. Um, let me say something about the importance of, um, of, of teachers. Me teachers you are you could well be the only person in a day who speaks to some of our children in a respectful way who smiles at them who acknowledges them who is on their side and your role is absolutely key you you totally bridge that gap between inclusion and exclusion and its consequences Of course, the children who um, we come across, they come with their own story. They come with their own narrative and that shaped them into the type of uh, children who, which, who, who present themselves before us. And I guess um, I've always sort of had certain children, if you like, you carry them in your mind, you've met them, they've had a lasting impression on, on you. And maybe even now you're thinking of young people and children who, um, who are doing that to you or have done that to you. Um, I, I remember uh, um, many children, actually, but a particular one comes to mind and, and I'll call him um, I'll call him Jordan. And I first met him when he was in year one and um, he, he had a real as, as sometimes happens, particularly summer born boys. They can have a real challenge transferring from uh, or transitioning from reception to year one. And he certainly had that challenge and was often sent to me or I heard his name mentioned by um, midday assistants or whoever. It, it, he certainly had some very, very challenging behaviours, which he demonstrated. And he was often in trouble with the police. I remember one summer holiday getting a call from um, a, a, a policeman who, who, who knew that his parents wouldn't be around and yet he'd been had arrested him for shoplifting or trying to remove the sort of um, the tags on goods in a particular shop. Uh, and knew that um, he, he could get through to me, so called me. And, um, and I had, a, uh, he, he had to work really closely with Jordan. And I think one of my challenges to myself and to the staff was, is who is on this child's side? Who, who, who's the advocate for this child? Who, who is watching, who's there to stand beside him? I'm not saying I would condone his behavior. I never ever would do that. But actually who's speaking out for this child? And if there isn't somebody you know, in the school, then, then, then who, then, you know, what, what chances did that child have? And I remember one of the reasons I remember um, Jordan so, so, so much was that when I, um, that when I was, when I left that particular school on the morning um, on which I left, we did the usual assemblies. I was a primary school head teacher, so I had an assembly, and um, I've been there a while. And I guess it was quite an emotional um, event for, for all concerned. It certainly was for me and I went back to my um, office and sort of tried to sort of regroup and, and check out what's going on and my PA said that um, Jordan was sitting outside my office and my office had two chairs and, and the children kind of figured that one chair was what they called the naughty chair and one was if you're not in trouble you just want to talk to um, Mr Warren. Um, that wasn't how I set it up but that's how the kids did it. Um, anyway Jordan was sitting on the not in trouble if you like chair and I went outside and just sort of saw him and he was absolutely sobbing, sobbing his heart out. And then I went up, sat next to him. Um, for, I was sitting on the naughty chair um, and uh, sort of just said, you know, what's up? Uh, and he just carried on crying. And um, 
I said, you know, you've been in trouble. Um, and he, he didn't really say much. And I said, you know, Jordan, the day's new, the day's young. You know, what, what's happened? Have you fallen out with your teacher? And, and, he, and he couldn't really speak. And, and um, uh, he was obviously very, very upset. And he was talking, you know, I was asking, you know, have you had a fight? Have you troubled somebody, something at home? Trying to find out the things. And I said, what is it? And he, he sort of said, it, it's, I mean, he just sort of said, you leaving, um, which he said in a slightly accusatory uh, voice. And um, anyway, I, I took him into my office and I checked if he had any breakfast. I think we probably got him some toast and stuff like that. And as we were talking, I, I don't know why I did it, but I wrote on a piece of paper, um, um, sort of post it. Well, it wasn't a post, it was actually probably sort of a compliment slip we had. Um, make, make me proud in all you do and say. I don't know why I wrote that, but I did, and probably I could have written some better things, but I wrote that, I folded it up and I gave it to him and he stuck it in his pocket. Um, six months later, I was working for the local authority. I was the assistant director of education in Stoke, and we had some trouble in one of the parks um, one summer's evening, and um, I had to send some youth teams down just to check what was going on and try to break up some of the gangs that were down there. And I was slightly worried about their safety, so I thought I'd go and check up on them. So I went down and um, I went to um, the particular park, and lo and behold, right in the middle of it all was nine-year-old Jordan, and um, I was slightly surprised a bit cross actually to see him there wondering what he was doing out so late anyway he came up to me and as I was about to sort of say what are you doing and you know and all that kind of stuff and where's your mum and stuff he, he took out of his he, he sort of took out of his pocket this scrappy piece of paper and um, I realized I mean it must I have no idea how long it'd been in his pocket for um, but it was really dirty it was really mangled but he took it out and he just handed it to me and he said I've kept it in my pocket and um, which was quite an emotional sort of moment. We, we, we don't know the impact we have on these children, um, but every child needs somebody who's on their side. And you as teachers, you spot those children who are likely to drop out of the system. And I guess the question and the challenge there is how good are we at spotting those children who are likely to drop out of the system uh, unless we do something radical? And just before I move off the importance of teaching, I just wanted to throw this one out as well. Um, you know, our, our vulnerable children, our young people, that need somebody who will go to unreasonable lengths on their behalf. And um, so sometimes that's us, because that was the quotation that again was given me, but often that's us. Um, and I know that you're doing that. And I know you've had to do that during this period more than you've ever had to do that before. So I've talked a little bit about the importance of leaders. Um, maybe one or two things have struck a chord there. I talked about the important role of, of teachers. Let me just say something about the, um, the department's role in this. And um, right from the, the outset, the department has understood the need to keep a special eye out for our vulnerable children. And so despite the various restrictions on school attendance, it has been really important to ensure that our vulnerable children can be in school. And that's been prioritized through each of the various lockdowns and restrictions that we've had to put in place. We were keeping very close track of the numbers of vulnerable children through a lockdown one, which was in sort of single digits, um, certainly below 10%. Um, of vulnerable children were in school in that lockdown and we were working very closely with local authorities and trusts to, to check that they've got eyes on um, and, and a plan and contact with those children who were not in school. Um, obviously there's much higher attendance last term and then during this term I think attendance of our vulnerable children is around about 35 percent. But we've also targeted support in other ways and I've just put a few of them up there um, some of them you, you may well be aware of. Um, and, um, you know, cl clearly, you know, we, we, we're sort of very conscious that there's so much more that we need to do. Um, and I say again that we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And so as we start working with um, uh, stakeholders and other policy colleagues on sort of what catch up looks like, um, and clearly it, it's going to be a longer term project, we need to be very, very uh, mindful of the impact on all our children, particularly on our vulnerable children, 
who will come out of this storm in, in, in a much um, tougher place than others. So I've said a little bit about leadership. I've said a little bit about teaching, um, a little bit about the role of the department. Um, so what or what next? And, and I guess it, it's, I, I don't know about you, but um, if you think back to where we were a year ago, what kind of predictions were you making about how long this, um, this pandemic would go on, uh, go on for? Maybe you thought, well, we'll certainly be sorted by September. Uh, maybe you thought, well, by Christmas, everything will be back to normal. I think we've all learned lessons on that. And when we're now, none of us are really able to say, excuse me, um, what life might look like post COVID. Except I think we can all say, we can all agree, it's not going to be straight back to things as, as they were. The pandemic has changed so much in our thinking and practice and no doubt many books and television programs will be made about this in the future. But I think what we can be absolutely sure about is that our children, our vulnerable children and young people will be shaped and even scarred by this for many years to come. It's not just a question of lost learning. Um, clearly there's been a lot of that, but it's about rites of passage which have been missed. Uh, I was chatting to some, um, some teachers who were talking about what it felt like the sort of the, the um, last summer with the, the year sixes um, not having their rites of passage. I've talked to parents about that. Um, I've got um, relatives myself who've, whose, who, whose children have left school and missed out those rites of passage. I've talked to many CEOs about the, how their year sevens have settled in and the kind of levels of maturity or, 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 or lack of maturity um, as a result of what's gone on. But it's not just about what they've missed, it's also about how we help them and support them to look ahead and navigate what lies ahead with some confidence and safety. And they're gonna need all of us in this endeavor. We can't um, bury our heads and pretend it's someone else's problem. It's gonna need this. It's gonna need that collaboration. Working together like never before combining what we corporately have at our disposal. Collaboration is going to be more important than it's ever, ever been before. Uh, I mentioned, uh, or made some reference to the fact that um, there is a lot of um, regular engagement between senior officials in the Department for Education and, and you know, significant stakeholders. So with the unions, um, with the um, local authority leads, with the local governance uh, association, um, with um, uh, Public Health England, a real join up about how can we work together to get the reopening right? How can we work together to ensure that the catch up programmes, it's not just a summer thing, but it's gonna be a much longer over the course of a parliament. Um, how do we get that right? And part of that collaboration will mean that you um, and your colleagues and we will need to be better at, sh at sharing intel. Um, we will need to be better at working with other local agencies, the police, the social care, making sure that we know what is shared. Um, sorry, making sure that we making sure that what we know is shared and passed on. Earlier, I posed a question about how good are we at spotting, predicting those children who are likely to drop out of the system unless we do something radical. I think it's fair to say that, and, and certainly my experience when I was a school leader was, we could have been better at sharing intel than we are currently. And I think we're going to need to be really good at that in the future. I wanted to put that up too, because I'm also aware that the challenges which, which um, lie ahead are certainly as great and as challenging as the challenges that we've had <clears throat> thus far. Uh, and I love that quotation. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never been in bed with a mosquito. And um, I'm sure that you, like me, have been moved by the example of Captain Sir Tom Moore. And if anyone illustrated the truth in the phrase, it's never too late to start, then it must be Captain Sir Tom. It is going to need us working together. It is going to need each one of us doing our part 
to try and support our vulnerable children. And my last slide and my last sort of thought that I leave with you is this. In Kenya, and I don't know if I've got the pronunciation right, but in Kenya, there is a, the greet, there is a greeting, which is Kaseri Ingera, and it means, how goes it with our children? And the reply that you're hoping for is, all the children are well. And what I like about this is that it's not my children or your children, um, the ones in your particular school, but all of the children. And um, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm indebted to um, Steve Mumby for, for this because he quotes it in one of his books. For the Maasai um, uh, people, the society can't be well unless all the children are well. It's about the future of the children. It's about the young people. And so leadership, um, whether in schools or in the classroom or elsewhere, is, is a huge privilege at, because it had, can have such a huge impact and positive impact on the lives of thousands, um, hundreds and thousands of children, young people. We're not just doing these things for ourselves. We're doing these for our children, young people, so that the world is a better place for those who follow. We're all in this. The children of West Midlands are our collective responsibility. There is another saying um, that we have not inherited the world from our ancestors. We've been loaned it by our children. This is a huge responsibility. It's a collective responsibility that school leaders, um, other support agencies, myself and my colleagues in the department, we take extremely seriously, as I know you do. And I, I just want to finish by um, saying that, uh, I, you know, I really wish you well in all that you do. Um, I know half term is coming up um, soon. I hope you manage to get a really good, I hope you manage to get a break, conscious that many people didn't get a break over Christmas. I hope you do get a break over half term. Uh, and I really wish you well and um, in, in, in what you're trying to do with your young people, your vulnerable children, as you try to um, consider children well-being and achievement and get that package just right. And um, I, I wish you all the very best and certainly can commit from my team um, in the West Midlands to do everything we can to work with local authorities and our schools to play our part in, um, in making sure that as we come out of this storm, that we're all in, in a boat of some kind that can carry on and, and has, a, has a strong future. I think that's all I want to say. I'm going to just stop there. I'm just about out of time as well. So thanks for listening. And um, I hope that some of what I said may have res uh, resonated a bit. Uh, and either way, I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. It was very uh, engaging uh, presentation and I do appreciate, and I'm sure we all do your time. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I know there's some comments in the chat. You Feel free to have a look, there's some really nice comments. Uh, and again, thank you very much. Um, and we are, because of time, going to have to move swiftly on to our next presenter. And if I could introduce um, David Jamieson. Uh, and again, uh, thank him for joining us. Um, he's currently the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner, so a very busy gentleman, but he's made time for us today, and I'd like to thank him for that. I'm just going to give me some time while I spotlight him um, and uh, give him time to switch his camera on and stuff, so bear with me one moment. Thank you, David. It's over to you. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? We can indeed. We can. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, could I also um, say well done and thank you to, to Andrew uh, for a very thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, I felt with some very, very interesting, insightful uh, stories within there. 
Um, thank you as well for inviting uh, me to make a short presentation, um, particularly about the work that, uh, that I am currently doing uh, with the police and how we are engaging that work uh, within the educational uh, context. You know, just reflecting on what Andrew said uh, in his, uh, his piece uh, in the last half hour, you know, there's a lot we can do in public services individually. We can be truly excellent individually, but collectively, we can do even more. If we are working together, working in synergy with each other, there's so much more uh, that we can achieve, in this case, on behalf of uh, children, and so much more we can do uh, to affect their lives in a positive way. Um, I have to say, when Andrew recalled um, his experience in, um, in, in Kenya, when I was in Kenya and Uganda a few years ago, um, I heard them referring to me as the Mbaze, and um, I, I asked eventually what this meant, and it meant old man. I thought, well, thank you very much. Uh, but, but somebody else did say to me, well, it means sort of wise, wise older male. And I, I did reflect on this. We don't have any words for wiser old people in the English language that I uh, know of. We, we've been through a period, particularly um, in my lifetime, of denigrating people of a senior age. Um, and we may want to reflect on that as, as well. Can I also say to, to all those involved in, in leadership in schools, uh, it is leadership indeed, not just of your school, your staff and your children, but it's offering that leadership to the wider community is what you offer as well. The leadership to parents and those in the uh, wider community uh, to how we can make things uh, better. And I do congratulate you on the work uh, that you've been doing in recent months. Uh, it cannot have been easy working through COVID-19, uh, trying to do distance learning uh, with children. And I, I don't think anybody who wasn't in, isn't involved in a school can even begin to uh, understand how much work that you have been done. So we've been doing so. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. The my role as police and crime commissioner, of course, unlike um, uh, Andrew as a commissioner, I am an elected uh, politician uh, to do the job that I do. I cover an area of just under three million people in the, the West Midlands and have a budget of just rising up to uh, 700 million pound uh, per year. The job is to make sure we've got proper policing, but it's also there to look at crime and how we reduce crime. And I've been particularly focusing on those early years, why it is some children transport themselves from being good upright uh, citizens to transport themselves into uh, criminality and a failed uh, lifestyle. There is no question that uh, COVID uh, has changed uh, the way in which we live. And my concerns have been particularly for children who have missed now a considerable chunk of their education. And as uh, Andrew said, they've been shaped and partly scarred uh, by what has happened. I think we all have a responsibility there. The responsibility that I see as well is that many of those children may, and so a minority, but unfortunately a significant minority, <clears throat> may then uh, transport themselves into uh, to criminality. And that is a, a major a concern of mine. What has happened is children, many children now have lost that purpose and rhythm and discipline that the school brings uh, to young lives. And many children may eventually, when they get back into full-time schooling, may find it very difficult to re-engage uh, with their education and their schools. And that is not just a challenge for schools, it's a challenge for all of society uh, to actually deal uh, with that issue. My uh, main concern has been that uh, youngsters, again, it is a significant but small minority of youngsters have drifted into the hands of the criminals and we've seen some increase in the uh, county lines, drug activity where children are sent often from big urban areas to set up a, <clears throat> a county line a drug a dealing a network in some of the more rural areas. It's affected both boys and girls, although I have to say um, mainly boys, some of them actually really quite young. Some children are seeking um, identity that they've some of what lost from being in school, they're looking for that identity amongst gangs uh, on the streets. 
many of those gangs do not wish those children well, nor do they bring about uh, for those children uh, good results. And we've seen, sadly, a violent uh, increase amongst some young people. It is a worrying trend uh, that some young people now and getting of younger and younger age groups are now turning to more extreme violence. What at one time might be a, a slap or a punch, sometimes now is a knife or something even worse uh, that they inflict uh, injury and harm onto to others. Just recently, we've had a, a, an appalling uh, killing of a, a young boy in Hansworth. Nothing I'm going to say relates to that particular incident because I'm not ascribing any uh, reasons or motives why that uh, happened. But there was something different about that crime and some of the other crimes uh, that we've seen recently. And it's the degree of frenzied, organized, protracted violence and brutality by really quite young people, 13, 14, 15 year olds, getting involved in things which were unheard of uh, at one time. It is a minority, but it is a worrying minority who are involved in that type of activity. Now, <clears throat> COVID-19, we have concentrated quite rightly on health and the economic impacts of COVID. Those are very important uh, to us. But you know, we've said very little about the social consequences uh, of uh, COVID as well, and what may follow in the future. Last uh, June, I wrote a short paper, which I called a Future Generations Deal, uh, which is on my uh, website. And I started to look at the particularly two categories. One was children who are missing a lot of their education. At that time, we thought they might miss six months. Now it's looking more like 12 months but also that slightly older group who are in the employment world, who, when the furlough schemes ended, tens of thousands of them uh, may find themselves unemployed or employable uh, for the uh, foreseeable future. That is a huge concern to us as a society. And the West Midlands and Birmingham in particular has some of the biggest problem here and biggest challenge because we are a very young region and Birmingham is the youngest city in Western Europe with half the population under the age of 25. And as we know, uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be involved in criminality. And if you're unemployed, uh, then the likelihood rises again. And I described at the time, and I don't um, resile from anything I said at that time, I said, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb of potential violence amongst uh, young people uh, who, then look to see how we've divided more as a society now between the rich and poor and, um, and also in att attainment as well. And just a, 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 just a brief thought, um, I, a young lad who lives not far from me is now in, in year 11. Uh, he has hardly missed any of his education. He's been working at a distance at home and partly when he could going into school and things have worked out fairly well for me. He'd prefer to have been in school full time. He's in, a, um, he's in a private school. His parents could afford uh, all the equipment and everything he needs. And I say good for him and good for the family. But I'm looking at a, another uh, young man of a similar age who doesn't have the internet connection at home. The library now has been closed for the last 10 months. There's no way of accessing uh, himself into the distance learning. So he has missed out largely uh, in his, on his education in that time. That is quite a worry because so much has been done in education in recent years to narrow the gap between the lowest and highest attainers. That gap, I'm afraid, has widened considerably and there will be consequences uh, to that as some of those people who have not done so well try to get themselves into the labour market and try to get themselves uh, working. The uh, I think a lot of the good work we've done in recent years uh, has been reversed and we have a mountain to climb in putting that right. And I have been saying to government particularly, we should be looking far more at how we can enable those families that don't have the connections to how to get into the connection with their education. On to, um, to violence. Um, the, I set up about six years ago, I set up a gangs and violence commission that was mainly working in the area just north of 
Birmingham city centre, where we saw a particular hotspot of violence. That work has now moved on partly into our violence reduction unit, uh, which came into being uh, as part of my office at the end of uh, 2019. And I just want to say something about the work we were doing before that on exclusions uh, from school. Now we know that the vast majority of children are doing very well in school and I, I still go and I did before while we still could go to schools. Uh, I saw children do extraordinarily well and you know I'm, I'm so proud of that. I'm proud of the work uh, that we're doing. But you know a minority of children have been excluded uh, from their school. Now I know the problem I, I worked in inner city schools myself. I was a head teacher for a while in an inner city uh, secondary school. So I know the problem. And uh, I recall myself uh, an exclusion uh, that uh, we were dealing with, with the governing body and our truly outstanding and excellent uh, chair of governors, the reverend gentleman from the local community. He sat back and sighed in his chair after we'd been through all the litany of things uh, that we tried to do with this particular boy. And he said, you know, I don't know how you've coped. I don't know how you've had the patience to deal with all this. But in the same sentence, he then went on to say, but what happens to him now? What happens next? Is he lost uh, to society? But in that particular instance, they weren't because we had really good backup services uh, where youngsters, that few that were excluded, could then find a good alternative education uh, that could challenge them for the future. I'm not sure that's always available uh, today. And I'm not sure that we now have, uh, because of the fragmented nature of the governance of our schools, uh, I'm not sure that we've now got mechanisms for making sure that children who are excluded, uh, who the school can no longer cope with, and I fully understand that, uh, where they go to uh, next. And that is a worry to me because many of those children have just dropped out altogether and almost become feral and on the street and then are become the victims of those criminal uh, gangs. Just to give you a, um, a feel for the statistics, the um, exclusions uh, from school doubled between 2010 and 2017 and I understand the figures have carried on even since then uh, very much. If you're in care of the local authority, you are twice as likely to be excluded. So why is that? Why is it children who have lost everything, essentially their family and all the connections they had, why, why are they the ones uh, that we're excluding from school? What, what are the things that we're doing uh, to help those youngsters? And you know, again, I do visit prisons from time to time. And I notice another statistic that of young offenders who are in, uh, prison for less than 12 months uh, sentence, 23% of them, nearly a quarter of them, have been excluded from school at some uh, time. So that is where a lot of those children who are excluded go. They go into criminality, uh, they go into becoming problematic, and they become a problem to society. I've had um, some discussions with the Children's Commission around Longfield and with Ofsted about this as well. And there is another issue that I know Ofsted picked up eventually, I kept raising it, and that is off-rolling. Children who the school, because they're trying to uh, enhance their exam figures, off-roll certain uh, children. Now, some schools are doing this, the vast majority are not. But what they were doing is just off-rolling children at the end of year 10 or early in year 11. So if they were going to get bad exam results, it wasn't, they weren't off-roll because of behavioral problems. Um, that frankly was a disgrace and I called it that, that at the time and you know I look as well at some of those schools and I know one school I won't name it but I have in mind uh, that's in a city centre area in the West Midlands I would say my assessment it would be as tough as uh, any school uh, in the West Midlands that school has not excluded any youngsters for the last six years so there's good practice there going about and what we should be doing is sharing that good practice so that we're not excluding those children uh, to, to a life of hopelessness and problems and, and difficulties. And the government, um, uh, they asked uh, Mr. Edward Timpson to do a review 
uh, a few years ago. It was published in May 19. I do uh, ask you to look at that if you haven't already done so. And I do say to government as well, get on and implement some of the, implement some of the proposals that were made there because they could make a real difference too. <clears throat> Can I just share something else as well? As someone who is a, I did, I'm not a former educator. I think I still very much am an educator. Um, in my office, we take um, young people, usually year 10 or year 12, for work experience. My office, my personal office isn't terribly big. It's about 35 uh, people of a broad range of ages and uh, ethnicities. About a third of the people in my office are from the uh, BME uh, communities in our area. Um, and we take people in for usually five day uh, work experience. And it, they've been a joy. And everybody in the office says, you know, isn't it good to have young people uh, working with us, people who are not actually employed, but actually working with us. And it's, it has brought something extra uh, to, to us as an organization. Now, what we've found generally, we've found people who are lively, they're willing, uh, we've found um, people with skills, they're very agreeable, um, and almost without exception, they've got excellent uh, IT uh, skills as well, and we can learn something uh, from that. But with our work experience, it's not an experience of watching people work, it's an experience of doing work. And we do say to them at the end of the week, they have to make a presentation, usually related somewhere within the policing world, but um, presentation at the end of the week, a joint presentation between them and the other person who's on work experience uh, with them. Those have been really uh, eye opening. But what I would say, and what I, one of the youngsters have said to me is within their education, many of them have said they've never ever had to make a presentation. They've never had to talk in front of other people. They've never had to use those oral skills uh, to a group of other people. I think we ought to reflect on that with our education system because much of work does rely very heavily upon that level of communication. The other thing that they've often said to me is we've never worked together with others in a team. I've never had to work with somebody I didn't know before because they lived in different schools. I've never had to sit down, work in a team and actually solve a problem or write a report or do a presentation together with someone else. And again, our education system now has driven out a lot of that working uh, together. Education is seen as very academic and very, very individual. And I just ask you to, to reflect on that as a thought, uh, that how can we re in, install that, this working together, teamwork, and particularly uh, developing oral skills, which even in the world that we're in today, oral skills are still very important. In fact, they, they're actually essential. <clears throat> I think the what we'll hear shortly, we're going to hear the, the next presentation is going to be about uh, our uh, latest document uh, that we have um, brought out through our VRU. And um, what, um, what partly what the, the document is saying there is that the single minded approach we've had towards academic learning, it doesn't leave much room in the, the curriculum and in the school time for other valuable life skills. And it is those life skills in the end that are part of the, the whole person. I don't think this is the fault of, uh, of, of teachers. I think it's partly politicians, probably people like myself and others uh, who have been putting more and more store on just on academic achievement, uh, rather than developing the, the wider uh, human skills and emotional uh, intelligence as well, which are so, so important. And I hope uh, that uh, we can see the Ofsted uh, inspections concentrating much more on uh, what those skills, those life skills, and not just on the, the, the league tables that we see at the moment. And, you know, I'd like to see Ofsted go into that school that hasn't actually um, ex uh, excluded a youngster for six years and say, how did you do that? Well done uh, to those teachers and others who have worked so hard to, to look after and ensure that those uh, young people aren't excluded uh, from society. So we should be actually rewarding those skills uh, too in young people. I have no problem with academic excellence. I, um, I do recall uh, 
young people with a school I was in in Leicester, um, young people coming uh, from uh, Uganda at that time. Uh, they were being thrown out by Idi Amin in the mid to late 70s. And a pitiful sight it was for someone who'd lost everything. Uh, they'd lost everything except their dignity and their will to learn. And, you know, to see some of those youngsters uh, at that time who came in with absolutely nothing other than the clothes that they stood in, um, I can see some of them now taking their G, uh, O level, it was as it was then, their GCSE uh, mathematics, which I taught at that time, taking it at year nine in 1116 school and then progressing into some of their A level work uh, before they left us at 16. And, you know, one young man, well, he was a young man, still um, corresponds with me. Uh, he's a GP, uh, still corresponds with me and sends me a Christmas card, even though he's not a Christian himself. Um, and that's 40 odd years ago uh, that he left uh, my classes. He's now con contemplating retirement as a general practitioner, and he's now going to give his life to working in the developing world, helping uh, other people. It, academic in, in, in achievement is very important, but there's a lot more uh, besides. Now, we're going to hear um, the, in the next presentation, the um, the re rewriting futures document, which is a, a VRU a document, which I hope uh, is a food for some thought as to how we can think more around those young people who do present as difficult and challenging, and look behind what's what the reasons are for that challenge behaviour, and how we can actually help those youngsters into successful and uh, fruitful uh, lives. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, if anybody wants to make a comment or a question, I'll be very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and we will move sw swiftly over to Becky. Um, and again, if anybody wants questions, please type in, in the, the chat. Uh, but we are going to listen now to uh, Becky and uh, Adrian and I will put you a spotlight so give me a sec while I just move you across and thank you again very much David. Hello everyone what an absolutely stimulating day it's been and we've heard from so many um, great speakers and I feel like what I'm about to say really just um, echoes and amplifies um, what others have said throughout the day. Um, it's a really, as I said, it's a really exciting day for us. Um, we're launching the report, Rewriting Futures, which was funded by the West Midlands VRU. It's actually incredibly um, innovative and forward thinking of the VRU to commission this kind of research, um, putting forward their perspective um, and the respect perspective of teachers and, and really importantly, children who are affected by violence and exclusion in West Mids. Um, it's the first of its kind um, in terms of what's been um, commissioned um, and hopefully um, will provide a really useful tool for everyone to um, really unite across the system um, in kind of making change happen and kind of ensuring that there's widespread alignment in terms of messages and we've heard a lot of alignment today in, in, in terms of the messages that you've heard from the speakers and also the comments in the breakout groups. Um, just so you know, my name's Becky. I'm the owner and head of research here at Revealing Reality. And um, I'm going to be joined by Adrian McLean, um, who's going to provide um, a response to the research um, from his perspective as a multi-academy trust leader um, and um, who's heavily involved in personal development and character education. So I'll hand over to him after I've kind of quickly um, run through the findings. And um, the VIU are also, team are also going to share a video link um, in the comments. Um, that video kind of captures some of the thoughts and responses um, to this, this research. I do have a watch of that um, after. One thing that I just wanted to say up front is that this report will not be new news to most people working in this area. There are some interesting kind of new framings, but really um, we are trying to help make clear what the kind of the, the key issues are and um, ensure that those those messages are, are, are strong and um, and available to anyone who's working in this sector. Um, the res the research um, that we did. Uh, combined perspectives from a, a range of different um, people. So we were lucky enough to do the, the research just 
um, pre the first lockdown last year. So it's almost a year ago um, now. And we were, um, we conducted ethnographic research observing in the school environment. Um, we also interviewed many teachers and, and not just teachers, other people working in, um, in an ed educational setting. Um, and really importantly, we, we talked to young people, many of whom had been excluded or were on the brink of exclusion or, or kind of going on a trajectory towards that. Um, and it's from all of that research data that we were able to make our conclusions. And we did have to quickly transition our research from, um, just as you all have been um, amazing in terms of um, transitioning your um, schooling to um, remote methods, we did also have to quickly transition our research to a remote method, which proved a load of challenge, a lot, very challenging um, and meant it took quite a lot longer to deliver than we had expected. But I'm sure you'll understand around those difficulties that you might face in transitioning to remote methods from you know, previous face to face. Um, anyone who joined our breakout group um, earlier would have heard the story of Lindsay and I really just wanted to um, me mention her again here because young people really are at the centre of this piece of research and what we found was that um, and we mapped the journeys of these young people. Um, and this is a very simplified version of those journeys. And what we saw was that meant much of the, um, they had very complicated experiences, lots of touch points, lots of interventions, but often those um, interventions failed leading to permanent exclusion. And in mapping journeys of people like Lindsay's, what we saw were um, lots of kind of commonality. So these children, um, often had um, social, emotional and mental health difficulties that weren't diagnosed until late. And you can see um, here from Lindsay's journey that her ADHD diagnosis actually came after permanent exclusion, after she'd left her family home, after she'd been involved with the police and actually hospitalised someone else, after she'd came into school drunk. So it was a very long journey for her to get that, get that diagnosis and the support she needs. And she puts that down she puts that diagnosis and, and the medical support that she then experienced as being um, absolutely pivotal in her being able to get her behavior under control. Now I want to be very clear that I'm not suggesting that, suggesting that all kids need an ADHD diagnosis, but it's the wider point that trying to understand the root causes of those behaviors and trying to put support in place to address those root causes is, is vitally important. Another key theme was that most of the children that had taken part in our, our research had had some kind of of adverse childhood experience, including trauma, many of whom lived in chaotic their own parents and actually we've got to speak to some parents as well and their parents often face some similar challenges to their children um, in terms of um, involvement in criminal justice system, undiagnosed mental health issues, um, you know past experiences of trauma and the like and that meant they were often living in an environment which was quite challenging and school was could have been and was for some a very um, uh, big part of their life in terms of a source of stability but they um, often um, didn't feel like they fitted in in these environments and um, some of the and as we'll go on to talk about in a second some of the disciplinary measures that were put in place meant that these kids felt like they were um, excluded or kind of ostracized from the very places that were probably the most stable environments for them and, and one of the one of the key things that we want everyone to think about is what's the negative and unintended consequences of disciplinary measures that are put in place to kind of keep the school under control but that might also reinforce or further legitimize how these children feel and what their identity is and what they um ha you know their kind of motivation to behave we also saw that some of those disciplinary measures put in place actually drove the kids to um bond with others who were like them it kind of um created peer networks around people who were experiencing disciplinary networks and actually um those peer those sort of negative peer networks or you know even gangs or, or kind of more um, other associations with um criminal networks w uh, really legitimized that poor behavior and even celebrated the, these kids experience of those disciplinary measures so we, people like lindsay would talk about how she would get likes on social media when she was excluded and that kind of thing it was a very legitimizing um, uh, thing for her. When talking to the kid, uh, to, to the teacher, sorry, it, it was obvious though that teachers had 
kids interests at heart you know this is a one quote but um it really um you know we many of the teachers shared the same sentiment so i want every child to believe that they can go to university that they can go on to be who they want to be some kids had never had anyone believe in that that's possible for them and that was a really strong sentiment that we heard from lots of teachers so we know that teachers are really really trying um to do this and they have high aspirations for their kids they they, they support however when we asked what they the schools would do doing about exclusions and violence they often focused on things like relationships with the police and things about kind of what's going on to kind of prevent weapons coming into the school and that kind of thing um, so and whilst this is really important and obviously a very important part of um, managing schools and ensuring schools are a safe place to be we we saw that these interventions were only coming sort of way too late in the journey really um you know once a child was already um showing the sort of serious behaviors that might call for police um involvement so there seemed to be a sort of um a, a, a dis a, uh, a, a lack of joined up thinking between the aspiration that the staff have for the kids and then the actions that are taken to kind of help them. Um, we did see many or many people, many teachers, many people working in the system, in, in the educational system and beyond acknowledging that there was need for wider support so um this quote here illustrates that so kids need to learn the skills to manage how they feel to manage difficult situations and complex social relationships these kids aren't getting that from their parents but all too often it was said it was quite difficult to put that into practice due to um, external pressures resourcing a lack of skills teachers not being trained in these kinds of um, tools so and a lack of support from other community organizations and a general sense that they, they should be focusing on those harder things like exclusions policing knife a crime prevention rather than focusing their energy into these kind of softer areas that could help ensure those kids feel included ensure that these kids have the support they need to um manage their emotions and, and behaviors so whilst people whilst the staff and system knew what was necessary often it didn't feel politically appealing to focus on them and actually they didn't have the resources or support skills they needed to necessarily be able to deliver against that so when you read the report which i hope you do what you'll see is one of the key messages in there is that the kids themselves need to feel that they have better alternatives to violence um, and exclusion um, they the kids that we spoke to felt that they were labeled as outsiders and, and became outsiders and took on an outsider um, role they often said that school didn't feel a the right place for them and it became a battle against the system and actually they got status from battling the system and um, this battle was legitimized by their new peers their peer group that kind of valued the, those kids as outsiders and the behaviors that um the behaviors that they exhibited escalated um and as we said some of the children that we spoke to that behavior escalated to even hospitalizing others you know serious injury um regular fighting etc so this is a long journey that these kids are on right from um early childhood and often the violence is a manifestation of um you know a series a long series of kind of feelings that that kid has about where they fit in in the school environment um, one thing the kids told us was that they didn't feel that they were currently getting this sort of support that they needed through the school environment and they the, the, the children had quite strong narratives that the school um, schools are judged by um, academic results and this is reinforced by um, uh, the teachers too and so the goal was not to keep the kids engaged or to keep them motivated or to inspire them about what they could achieve even if they weren't the most academic kids they just felt that if they weren't academically gifted then they weren't really valued by the school and and therefore um were not to be kind of invested in and supported in so there seemed to be a clear link in the kids mind that if they weren't the brightest kids if they weren't going to go to university then those those kids were were less um were less were lesser than the others and and therefore kind of um, not given the support they need um, so overall the report has a number of recommendations um, and one of the the big kind of challenges back to the system is that we need to rethink how we are supporting young people to develop the motivation and the skills needed to write their own futures now we believe that this 
um, kids do need support, but this is something the children need to do for themselves. They need to take ownership of it. They need to believe themselves that there's there's a future out there, there for them. Um, but in order to do that, they need to be supported and, and encouraged. And often they weren't getting that encouragement that they needed at home. So um, school becomes a really vital touch point to ensure that these kids are motivated and, and do feel that they have the skills and capability to take ownership of having a positive future. Um, this is, and whilst I say schools are really important touch point, schools aren't the only um, place where this needs to happen and it does need to be a whole systems approach. So schools are important and that's not just teachers, that's all staff, that's governors, that's everyone around schools, that's other parents um, in the school environment, but also the wider regional authority. So youth services, local authorities all need to be supporting this message and getting on board and ensuring that we are supporting kids from as early as possible, identifying those kids who come from traumatic families who might be struggling at home, who might be at risk of this as early as we can. But there's also um, impl implications for Ofsted, league tables, the wider policy and wider policy makers. You know, the strong, strongest KPIs that schools have are around academic achievement. And the report calls for a greater focus on those KPIs that um, will help to rebalance away from academic achievement and ensure that we are rewarding um, um, children's development as a round, not just academic, academic success. And whilst while schools are judged mainly on academic performance, we will always see these kids that are struggling um, with um, more kind of conventional academic performance. We'll always see them um, as kind of difficult in the school environment and their behaviour will always be, um, be challenging to that objective. So in terms of some specific recommendations, um, schools need to become more genuinely inclusive of all children, no matter their background, no matter um, what social and emotional um, needs they have. Um, we specifically need to consider the unintended consequences of the disciplinary tools, um, which may benefit the classroom in the short term, but may reinforce outsider status for young people and don't actually help them to progress necessarily, and may actually even um, create status and reinforce that outsider status. We, we need to put the support in place to enable young people to regulate their own emotions and behaviours in all aspects of life, um, not just rely on highly structured school environments. And whilst I haven't talked about it extensively, I just wanted to say that one of the things that we saw that was some children who were being kept um, on the behavioural straight and narrow in a school environment, but were not able to regulate their behaviour in outside of school and um, partly because the strictures they were able to behave with all of the kind of structure in place but they, they they weren't able to as soon as they leave and actually leaving school was a big trigger for them to kind of lose control of their behavior um, and so we need to think about how we how school how the implication of how we treat kids in school and how we expect them to behave in school has on their ability to um to manage their behavior sort of 24 7 and into the future not just how they behave when we see them at school. Um, we need to ensure that children are supported to achieve a range of positive trajectories and that status and support is given to all routes, not just the academic route. So vocational training, you know, whatever the child's goal is, positive goal, I should say, not just any old goal. And we should um, help find ways to help and encourage that. And finally, we need to assess and report on holistic development of children in schools, um, as well as analysing academic outcomes. So that's the KP, KPI point again. Now, I recognise these are all really lofty recommendations and mo many people have already um, shared their thoughts and, and echoed the importance of these findings. So what we're hoping is that the report um, that makes these clear recommendations will be a tool for you to get others on board, to grow the agenda, to convince people who aren't already convinced by these arguments, to help have um, conversations um, and, and cha change the, the narrative. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Adrian, who's going to share his perspective from a school's um, leadership perspective. Hi, thanks, Becky. Um, first thing I, I want to say is that th this is really um, no surprise to to any of us what this report says, and, it, and I think for all of us that are in education, it's a it's a very welcome report at, at this time. Um, I'd like to start by saying that. Throughout the day, it's been really interesting listening to everyone and, and the language that um, is used, it, I think we need to really know is powerful. Words are extremely powerful and they fuel the stories 
uh, that we tell ourselves and can have aspirational or severe impact on others, particularly our children. So when we talk about catch up and missed learning to, uh, as a terminology, I don't think it's helpful in this context, in context. I think we need to really focus on what children need for their well-being rather than what they've missed. And I think um, the message that I want us to, to take away today is that it's going to take all of us working collaboratively or more collaboratively over a sustained period of time to make that happen. So um, I'm going to talk through the response to, to the main recommendations um, made in the report, but I want you to all think about, everybody who's here, I want you to think about the important question is how do we do this effectively? How do we do this together? Because we're all here because we want to make that change. We're all doing positive work, but it's not going in the direction we want it to do at present. So how can we do it so we make sure that we, we move it forwards? So the first recommendation is ensuring supported to achieve a range of positive trajectories and status and aspiration associated with all routes, not only academic. I mean, that's a really interesting one to pick up first, um, as the current education system is one that's quite rigid and means that head teachers have a significant um, pressure on them to get results. Having been a head teacher myself, I know exactly what that feels like. Um, getting those GCSE results, A-levels, Ofsted ratings, it's really unhelpful in the context of developing all young people meeting their needs. Because what, what tends to happen is that a decision has to be made. You have to make sure that you can get those results. And, and unfortunately, some young people have to fall by the wayside when we're operating in that manner. Evidence-informed research, though, such as the one the report we're talking about today, and, and many body education endowment foundation, the Sutton Trust, for example, they all point towards the development of the whole child being beneficial. As you've heard from Andrew Peterson this morning, the Jubilee Center for Character Education has a number of studies that show the explicit development of character in young people makes a, a huge difference in raising aspirations, confidence, and a belief that they can achieve their potential. Potential that some of our young people don't see because they've had a variety of circumstances that prevent them from being able to see clearly, such as difficulties at home. They've been subjected to ACEs, trauma, or even parents who have had traumatic experiences of education. Therefore, they're not invested in education and put that burden upon their, upon their children. Uh, I think it's really imperative that we show our young people that uh, education is not a one size fits all. Academia and university is one route. And I think it's summed up perfectly by Elon Musk, who, who famously said, we shouldn't confuse education uh, with intelligence, as you can have a bachelor's degree and still be an idiot. By putting university graduation as a pinnacle um, of education, we're deterring some of these young people from the aspiration, creativity and innovation. Um, we need to make sure that we provide pathways that are not stigmatized for, for all people and enable them to show their brilliance in different ways. To do this, this is going to require some systemic change. The second recommendation of enabling young people to regulate their own emotions in all aspects of life and not rely on highly structured school environments, I, I think is the most pertinent one. And um, we always make assumptions that kids know how to do certain things or, or that they, they know them when they come to us, particularly in secondary school, um, and that they're choosing to misbehave. Actually, a lot of the time they, they don't know or societal rules have changed or um, they're adapting to, to the changes that are out there. So, for example, you know, if you look at when I was younger, which may seem like a, a long time ago now, but um, we didn't have social media and the, the complexities of the of social media in the virtual world have, have changed the outlook for young people. The, the extended periods of lockdown and isolation have also complicated this. Um, so I think that we need to really take a step back and think about how do we em empower our young people to be able to communicate and regulate their emotions. So on the flip side of that, I understand and, and I get it, school leaders are under significant pressures have already said to get results and are at risk of losing their jobs if they don't get the results. And, and therefore it means difficult decisions have to be made. The culture of schools dictate this and, and organizations, um, they employ some of those, uh, you know, for want of a better phrase, zero tolerance rules, which are unhelpful in this situation because children will comply to them in school, but then 
they're not able to do that outside of school. What we need to do is we need to teach young people how to self-regulate. I know that many, uh, many staffing schools work tirelessly to support children and the young people that they work with, and enabling them to be the best version of themselves they can be. However, this can be hamstrung because resources are limited. A lot of schools have a lack of time and funding to, uh, to, uh, to give the appropriate funding, resource and support. Couple that with those result pressures that I've already talked about um, leads to the position that we're in and we're now discussing. Um, I think another point to, to, to bring up is the schools that are really successful in, in doing the things that I've just talked about, who managed to make the sum of the parts greater than the whole, can be penalised um, by being asked to do more with less. And, and, and that's, that's not a, a, a very strategic way forward because it, it means that people don't want to do that. They, they can't do it. They're actually working above and beyond already. And without the investment, without the support, they're not going to be able to continue to do that. Additionally, as a profession on the whole, um, teachers are not truly tr uh, trauma-informed and they don't know how to deal with this effectively in the classroom uh, and, and balance this with learning. Um, we have to work to develop this. We have to work to develop that understanding. And again, that's going to take time and that's going to take investment. We have to start that time and investment right back in our ITT um, institutions. Um, as I've already alluded to, I think young people aren't always able to express themselves with coherence and clarity. Um, we all know, uh, from all the people who are here, we all know um, that behaviour signifies uh, either a need being met or not met. So when we're talking about unacceptable behaviour, schools are often dealing with complex issues that, all, uh, that may require multi-agency collaboration and support. However, funding, waiting lists, access are all barriers to effectively being able to do this, which we need to find ways to remove. This leads to often the most vulnerable children being excluded from school, and we need to do more to ensure that they're supported. The ramifications of this were highlighted in the Timpson report. Young people only know what they see and they accept it as the norm. So if they live in a dysfunctional household, for example, then they're not going to know any different when they come into school. We need to work with them. We need to work with other agencies to make sure that they can understand that. And that takes time and that takes some patience. Referring back to, to character education, I think um, we've got to teach children about the merits of character virtues and their application of them to help them understand the world around them. Again, that takes time, that takes patience, that's not currently there in the curriculum. If I use the example of, of honesty and how that can um, collide with, with some of the other virtues around, you know, for example, compassion. So if I said to my wife, how do I look today? Um, she could either be honest with me or, you know, if I'm not looking too great, she might be a little bit more compassionate. Our children don't always have the skills to do that. And I think we need to, to educate them in being able to do that. So looking at this again, going back to talking about zero tolerance policies, I think we need to understand what that term really means in, in education. I think it's a little bit misused. All, uh, all behaviour management policies are, are zero tolerance. Um, and because what we're saying is we don't accept that behavior. What we, what we can't do is say, if you do this, you're out of here and you're not gonna be welcome here. What we have to do is we need to teach children to understand how to deal with that situation and they've made a mistake and that we need to rectify it. Some of those mistakes can be catastrophic, absolutely. I'm not saying that we don't, we don't have to sanction children. What I'm saying to them is that if this was a maths class and they didn't understand how to solve that maths problem, we would work with them in a different way. When it comes to behavior, we're, we're often quite quick to say, no, we're not gonna deal with that in a different way. And I think we need to, to think about that problem in, in a more complex way. Lastly, I'm gonna go and talk about the, the last point of assessing and reporting um, on holistic development of children in schools. I mean, not every child has a stable or home life, which automatically puts them at a disadvantage. However, the education rightly or wrongly assumes that all children arrive at school with foundation skills and they have a basic level that they're going to start with. Um, and uh, they've picked that up from home. That's not the case. We know that's not the case. And when and there's no clear remedy for this when that those skills and those um, 
that learning hasn't taken place. Research shows us that uh, throughout school, those children um, who, who come to school in that position, the gap only gets wider. And, th and this is a system-wide issue that can't be resolved by schools alone. I mean, teaching our, our children valuable skills and allowing them to take part in learning, which is not solely academic, which focuses on such things as oracy, debate, teamwork, developing leadership, will set them in good stead to become well-rounded members of society. I'm an advocate and a student of character education, and my experience tells me that embracing this concept makes a significant difference to our young people. Most schools deliver some form of character education, but not explicit in imagining it uh, that way. Many schools, uh, for example, focus on the performance virtues, looking at resilience, motivation, perseverance, uh, for example. However, developing the four types of virtues Andrew Peterson talked about this morning in a balanced manner is definitely a promising way forwards. The move by Ofsted to include um, personal development and character within the inspection framework is a great start. However, this needs to be enforced in a much more stronger and important way. And I think the last point I'm going to cover on this is uh, research shows us um, that employers aren't truly focused on academic results. They're very much interested in the wider picture that potential employers can bring to the organisation. Therefore, what we're telling our children is a mismatch with what employers are asking for. Um, so then th th they, they don't value it. Um, and that's where we, we've got a gap and we've got to close that gap. And I think we have to do that quite quickly. Many young people come from disadvantaged backgrounds, have qualifications, uh, as an example, will lose out on those roles because they've not had those wider life experiences and opportunities some of their more affluent peers have. I think looking back at my own personal experience, I would have been a pupil premium child and, and my own personal development was harnessed by being able to participate in high level of sport and developing key uh, character traits of discipline, determination, resilience, patience and confidence, uh, as well as self-control to name a few. So I think that that's, you know, those are the key points that I'd like to, for us to all to consider. I mean, summing up, we need to facilitate, enable and encourage our young people to find their vehicle to develop in their own character traits uh, to make them successful. And, and, you know, I really welcome that particular point um, as an outcome of and, and a finding uh, of this research. Um, and I'd finally like to finish off by asking everyone here today, because we care so much and we're so passionate about education and making a change and reducing exclusions, and improving the life chances for our young people. I want us all here today to go away and make a pledge to do something different based on the information and learning that we've undertaken today. Because if we keep doing the same things we've always done, we're going to get what we've always got. So please, I want you to take this information today, make a pledge, and let's start to live, live that pledge and move forwards. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I think that, like, like someone's just put into the, the text, that is the, a good way to end the conference. And I would like to thank you and every, every other presenter and for the people taking part today um, in the conference to make it such a success. And this is only the, the start of the process. You know, we've started to, to look at um, social justice and inclusion and vulnerability and now we do need to move things forward um, and just to finish off really what I'd like to say is um, all the recordings will be put on to uh, the Education Observatory website and all the presentations will be asked from presenters to be again shared on the present uh, on the Education Observatory website but also the um, violence reduction unit uh, resources and links will also be found there and there'll be additional resources that we'll be sharing via the websites and on that point can I wish you a pleasant afternoon thank you very much for taking part I do apologize about the slight hiccups we've had throughout the day but thank you for bearing with us and that is really important um, and please have a very very pleasant afternoon and um, stay safe everybody you take care bye-bye thank you